to those of you on the East Coast, and good evening to those of you joining us from Europe. We have just a few housekeeping notes to cover before we get started today, right at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. So first of all, we want to know who is here with us today. So please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, share your name, your affiliation, or where you're calling in from today. And let us know what you're excited to learn about or why you registered for the event. And be sure to send your chats to all panelists and attendees as noted on the slide. That way everyone can see the um, chats. Again, if you're just joining us, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name, affiliation, and where you're calling in from. Great, we got Dan Gardner from Wild Cornell Medicine. Welcome. Timothy from Europe. Hey there. Clayton from University of Pittsburgh, welcome. Lisa from Boulder, hi. We have Marta from Guatemala, excellent, welcome. Welcome Georgia from Bologna, Italy. Shana from Philadelphia. Benedict from King's College, London. Bossam from Seattle, hi neighbor. Welcome to those of you just joining us right now. We are just doing introductions. If you wanna open up the chat panel from your Zoom toolbar, you can send your name and affiliation and where you're calling in from today. Welcome, John from University of Wisconsin Madison. We have Gustavo from ISB here in Seattle. Hello again. Welcome Irene from University of Missouri, Venkatesh from Toronto, Takeshi from Kyoto, Joseph from Hungary. Excellent to see people joining us from all across the globe. So we welcome you to continue to introduce yourselves in the chat window. I have just a few more housekeeping remarks before we get started today. So as we get started, if you do have questions for presenters, please be sure to share those in the Q&A window rather than the chat panel. That's also in your Zoom taskbar. Be sure to include the speaker's name um, in the question so we know to whom it is directed and be sure to click send. Now, once you open that Q&A panel, you'll see an area to type in that window. And we do have scheduled time for presenters to answer questions from the audience after each of the presentations, as well as some discussion with the moderators. Um, some of the questions will be answered live and some will be typed after the presentations. If we do type an answer to your question, you'll be able to see that by clicking over to that My Questions column. And then answered questions from other attendees will appear under All Questions. If you are having any connectivity issues today, we have a couple of options for you. 
First is you can view the event stream on YouTube by clicking the option at the top of your Zoom window as shown here. You are also welcome to call in from your phone for better audio by clicking switch to phone audio in the audio settings panel and then following the prompts to dial. Here is a brief overview of our agenda for the day. We do hope that you can stay for the entire program, but if you do have to step away, we will be posting a full recording of the event on our website and our YouTube channel after the event concludes. Just a couple more minutes. I'll check in and see how our intros are going. Hi, Orna from New York, Rockefeller University. Mark from Glasgow, hello. And just one final reminder, once we get started, if you do have questions for presenters, we, we will have time to answer those live as well as typing them. Be sure to ask those in the Q&A panel rather than the chat. Be sure to include the speaker's name so we know to whom the question is directed. That is what the chat panel looks like. You can type your question there and be sure to hit send. Any questions that you ask will appear in the My Questions column and all other questions asked by other attendees that have been answered will appear in the All Questions column. Again, if you do have any connectivity issues throughout the day, um, issues with Zoom, you can switch to our YouTube live stream. There's a button for that at the top of your Zoom window. You can also switch to phone audio to reduce the bandwidth on the um, computer that you are watching from. Again, here's our agenda for the full session. We're gonna get started in just a moment. And feel free if you're just joining us, send that intro in the chat, say hello, let us know where you're calling in from. We are excited to have you all here today. As we are just hitting half past, I am going to go ahead and introduce Kathy Richmond, director of the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, and she's going to get us started for today. Please welcome Kathy. Wonderful, thank you, Megan. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you today for our event. Um, it's uh, we had hoped to host it in Seattle, but we are very excited to um, be hosting today the virtual Allen Institute Conference on Human Brain Evolution, which we've termed Expanding Minds. My name is Kathy Richmond, and I'm the director of the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, a division of the Allen Institute. Now, obviously, um, it's, it's a, a, a big day for many speakers, and, and we want to get to the talks quickly. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Allen Institute, and specifically our group, the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group. Now, our group extends our founders' commitment to tackling the toughest questions in bioscience beyond the institute walls. And by identifying compelling, hard problems and visionary researchers and teams to tackle them, both across the US and internationally. Now, as many of you know, the Allen Institute was founded in 2003 with the Allen Institute for Brain Science. And this is just one of our divisions. Um, our other divisions uh, were launched um, subsequently in 2014, the Allen Institute for Cell Science was launched. And in 2018, the Allen Institute for Immunology. 
Now with our team and, and on these other divisions, and we're all housed in under one roof in Seattle, in our Seattle headquarters uh, in South Lake Union. Uh, I'd like to play a brief video to describe what the Frontiers Group is and what we do and what our impacts aim to be. And then I'd like to follow up with, with just a bit more information before we turn it over to today's um, talks. You know, one of the easiest things that people can say uh, to rebut something is, it's never been done, it can't be done until it's done. So how do you get people to believe in something that, yeah, it's never been done? But imagine we've never been to the moon, right? Antibiotics is flaming through away his Petri dish. Where would we be with disease? So it's really important, I think, to believe because that's what advances the human condition. It's individuals who've had the courage to say, we need to do this. I don't know what I'll find, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because that's how we advance. The Paul Jalen Frontiers Group seeks pioneers, seeks explorers, seeks people who are willing to make big advances, take risks, ask questions, be tenacious, and have curiosity to change the face of biology. The Frontiers Group is a division of the Allen Institute. Unlike our other colleagues, we look externally, we look outside of the Institute to see where are the breakthroughs, where is the science that really needs that catalytic funding to push through. We have two primary mechanisms of support. One is the Allen Distinguished Investigator, and that's for an investigator or a team for over three years of funding at $1.5 million. Another mechanism is the Allen Discovery Center. These are larger teams and longer term investments of up to eight years and $20 million. Both investments are meant to hit high-risk, high-reward questions and really to move the field in directions that will have a lasting and sustainable impact. There are very few places that are willing to really take this kind of risk, that are willing to say, we don't know exactly where this is going, but we believe in you. I can't think of a better investment in terms of payoffs. And history has shown that these investments pay off. Most scientists are used to the idea and used to the concept that to make advances, one has to take risk. The real challenge is supporting those types of experiments, and most agencies are very conservative. The Frontiers Group is unique in the sense that they allow you to do experiments which at the outset don't have a defined end, and it's possible that they don't all work out. This ability to do these types of experiments is a real strength of the Frontiers Group, and it enables the type of thinking and the type of experiments that has the potential at the outset to possibly change the way we think about a problem and perhaps even lead to treatments for diseases further down the line. You have to be comfortable sort of with that unknown and with the fact that you might fail. It's not like a traditional funding mechanism where you can define in five years exactly what the outcome is. Honestly, if you can define in five years what the outcome is, maybe it's not that interesting or it doesn't push us in the same way. For better or worse right now, science, um, it's very easy to get siloed. And this is why we hold multiple meetings a year, really trying to bring our researchers together to get new knowledge, new insights, and really cross-pollinate those ideas. People from different disciplines, they look at things in quite different ways, often in very different ways. And so getting a different perspective can often nudge you in a direction that you hadn't previously thought of and in the best cases can even suggest a new experiment. The best science or the real breakthroughs, they always occur at the edges between fields. And we really need men and women who can see the problem at the level of the atom, the cell, the tissue, the clinic, and bring that together to solve big problems. I would say the goal of our group is to make a difference at the end of the day, to find those ideas, to find those researchers that really have the possibility to move the field. Um, they're out there, but right now the funding is such that it's challenging to find those high-risk, high-reward funders who will support that kind of exploratory work. And that's what we want to do. We want to make that difference and make an impact. Paul Allen's vision and also the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group um, has made it all possible. You know, you can want to uh, reach the frontiers, but unless you have individuals who are willing to bet on that, take risks on individuals and those ideas as well, it doesn't happen. So this is a partnership and we go there together and it's amazing to be part of such a visionary group.
So welcome back. I hope that video um, gives you more uh, background as to start my video as to uh, as to who we are and what we do. Now, um, we welcome you to explore our website. We'll be releasing a diverse array of initiatives and RFPs in the months ahead. And we also welcome you to sign up for our newsletter to learn more about those. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our meeting organizers, Dr. Chris Walsh, Dr. Michael Greenberg, and Dr. David Reich. We, they lead the Allen Discovery Center at Boston Children's Un uh, Hospital. And they are working to inspire and push forward the entire field of human brain evolution and their breakthrough research. It was a pleasure to work with them to bring together this fantastic lineup of speakers today, and I look forward to the program. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. David Reich to say a few words to kick off the program. David. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, um, happy to be the first in our center Center to, to get a chance to tell you about our center and uh, also to have the honor to introduce the first speaker, uh, Sarah Tishkoff. Um, so just briefly uh, a little bit about our center. Um, we uh, are the Allen Discovery Center for Human Brain Evolution. Uh, our center started in August 2017. Maybe next slide, please. Um, and um, the uh, um, the, and if you could just click through to sort of show the bullet points, that would be good. The, the, goal, the goal of our center was really to really tackle what's really a, a very, very, very big question. And so it's really impossible to tackle just in a short period of time, uh, but really to address this mysterious question of how we got to be the way we are today as a species and what makes us different from other species to the extent that we are different from other species. A suspicion is that some of the important differences lie in our very large brain compared to our closest living cousins, the chimpanzees. Um, and while there are ex a, uh, extinct groups of humans in the skeletal record like Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans and others, uh, we don't have, um, uh, we can't study them as a living species. And so, uh, what we have to go by is the archaeology, but also we have to go, uh, we have genetic data, uh, the variation that exists within modern humans, which goes back millions of years, and also now ancient DNA from uh, ancient humans going back uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and we can compare these to each other and try to understand the differences that have accumulated um, uh, leading to people today. We can also go back deeper in time and try to understand uh, the nature of evolution on brain-related traits in our lineage. So that's our window. We're trying to use the genetics as a tool to understand uniquely human evolution. Um, even studying present day, uh, so a question, for example, that we are interested in is, you know, how are Neanderthals who had brains as large as ours and lived till about 40,000 years ago uh, in Western Eurasia, how are they different from modern humans? Is it the result of one, a few strong mutations or many, many genetic changes all occurring in parallel? Perhaps uh, evolution is continuing in some ways and we can study it in time series data. Next slide, please. So we launched our Discovery Center in August 2017. There are three groups. Could you click through? Uh, my group is focusing on this bet that ancient DNA time series data, mostly within the last 10 or 20,000 years, can give us a, a microcosm, a picture of how evolution occurs in time by taking advantage of ancient DNA time series data um, and uh, maybe allow us to extrapolate to somewhat deeper in time as well about how this such evolution occurs. Um, Chris Walsh and Mike Greenberg work on different aspects of brain evolution, uh, especially on human accelerated regions in Chris Walsh's case and studying them in modern uh, cohorts of disease risk patients, starting understanding the, de the, the, the development of human, uh, human neurodevelopmental disease. And Mike Greenberg's group uh, studies um, experience dependent gene transcription and evolution of the program uh, in primate and human neurons. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I'm really excited to introduce uh, our first speaker, Sarah Tishkoff. Um, the original Expanding Minds meeting was going to be an in-person meeting um, on April 1st and 
second of this past year. We weren't able to hold it, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. Um, but this virtual meeting uh, takes some of those uh, speakers uh, that we were particularly excited to bring together and uh, creates a meeting that's shorter, but is um, uh, modified and tailored to work hopefully well in a, a virtual format. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Sarah Tishkoff. Sarah has been uh, the leader unquestionably in trying to understand patterns of variation in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the cradle of our species. Uh, there is more diversity in Sub-Saharan Africa today by far than in the rest of the world combined. And non-Africans today are a little butted off population maybe somewhere between 50 to 70,000 years ago from that African homeland of our species. Sarah has been uh, studying that in all sorts of rich ways from studying deep time and uh, uh, archaic lineages contributing in diverse ways to African populations, both in West and East Africa and in other parts of Africa. Um, also really uh, thinking very hard about uh, variation in traits and specifically made this very important discovery of um, variation in, in lactase persistence phenotypes, uh, ability to digest cow's milk occurring independently in different groups in Africa, different pigmentation phenotypes. Uh, she's working on, um, on, on uh, studying difference in drug metabolism and all sorts of traits in in these very diverse populations. Without further ado, um, I'll, uh, um, I think Sarah will uh, give her talk for the next half hour, and then we'll have a question and answer session uh, that I'll kick off and then open to the audience for questions. Look forward to Sarah's talk. Well, thank you for that awesome introduction. I'm so excited to be here. I wish it could have been there in person, but that's okay. This is the next best thing. So I wanna tell you about our research, which is focused on human evolution and adaptation in Africa. Let's get this first one going here. There we go. So these red dots represent the locations of fossils of anatomically modern humans, the oldest of which is dated to around 300,000 years ago, found in Morocco. So all modern humans originated in Africa. Um, we also have evidence for early modern human behavior. This is from a cave in South Africa. Uh, they found this um, artifact dated to around 100,000 years ago. And they found evidence of pigments in the shell. So they call it an artist toolkit. And they think that people were using this to either paint cave paintings or perhaps to adorn their own body. So after this origin in Africa, somewhere around 50,000 to 80,000 years ago, relatively small number of people could have been in the hundreds, most thousands, migrated out of Africa, giving rise to all other populations around the world. We now know that when they left Africa, they ran into uh, and interbred with archaic populations such as Neanderthals and Denisovans, and such that today uh, there's somewhere between roughly two to six percent of the genome of non-Africans is descended from these archaic populations. So this uh, demographic history has shaped the pattern of variation that we see today in modern populations. So how much do we differ? Well, identical twins, if we look compare the genomes of identical twins, there should be zero differences. We now know there might be some, but should be zero. If we looked at the genomes between any pair of unrelated humans, we differ at about one out of a thousand sites, human versus a chimp, one out of a hundred, human versus mouse, one out of 30, and human versus broccoli, two out of three. Given that there are three billion DNA bases, that's around three million nucleotide differences on average between any pair of genomes. But we also know that there are other types of variation, such as structural variation. These can be insertions and deletions and gene duplications and inversions. And we're still at the beginning, I would say, of starting to characterize that type of variation. However, every study for the past 50 years or more has shown that the majority of variation is within populations relative to between populations because of this recent common ancestry in Africa. 
So I'm going to be focusing on Africa. I want to tell you a bit about African uh, ethnic diversity. There are over 2,000 languages spoken in Africa that have been classified into four major language families shown here. People who speak Afro-Asiatic languages are in the north and east of Africa. People who speak Nilo-Saharan languages who tend to be pastoralists are in central and eastern Africa. The most wide-ranging language family is niger kordofanian also known as Niger-Congo. It arose in western Africa. The largest subfamily are the Bantu languages, and they arose, it's thought, on the border of Cameroon and Nigeria. And they had in, invented iron tool technology in some, something called slash and burn agriculture. So they could go off into the forest, cut down the, the forest, and grow food and sustain a large population size. So they were very su successful at migrating across Africa. And they really shaped the genomic landscape in Africa today. And then we have in green um, are people who speak a uh, click language, which has been classified as Khoisan. These include the San hunter-gatherers from Southern Africa and two groups in Tanzania, the Hadza and the Sandawe. So uh, despite the importance of Africa for understanding human evolutionary history, um, it has been greatly underrepresented compared to other populations in human genetics uh, research trying to forward this, and it must just be really slow. Let's try it here. There we go. Okay, so these are some of our African collaborators uh, that we've worked with, um, and I wanted to show you a little bit of what this is like. I think these photos are taking a long time to load. So this is from Ethiopia, and we are we are studying minority populations who practice indigenous lifestyles. So these groups tend to live in very remote areas, requiring use of a four-wheel drive vehicle. We have to bring all of our supplies with us. I like this because it gives you the outside perspective and the inside perspective, which is really crowded. And in Tanzania, uh, these two individuals in the upper right-hand, lower left-hand corner are Hadza hunter-gatherers. This woman in the upper left is a Nilo-Saharan speaking pastoralist. And this is our setup for doing uh, biometric measurements. So we're really careful to do this research in an ethical, oop, it just went ahead one. We're very careful to do this research in an ethical manner. And that means getting uh, consent, not just at the level of the IRB, but also at in each country. And then um, we do a lot of community discussion. We translate into the local language and we discuss this in layman's terms. And we answer questions and talk about risks or benefits if there are any. And it's only after we get community consent that we then go on and get individual consent and can do the research. We also think that returning results to participants is important. Um, the Hadza don't read science, but we do translate, um, put this into layman's terms, the summaries, and I can show them some of the images that I'm going to show you today from that study. And they really appreciate that when we do that. Also important is training and capacity building in Africa. I've had the honor of training a number of grad students and postdocs. And the idea should, is that this research should be done as much as possible on the African continent. So in these regions, we're collecting blood. And from the blood, we can get DNA. We can get RNA and frozen plasma. We can get detailed information about uh, ethnographic information, diet, and any medical history that people may have. And then we have to process these in areas where there's uh, little or no electricity. So here we have the generator um, that's up in the lower left here. We could set that up and basically just set up our lab in the bush. So then we are um, measuring uh, different phenotypes in a non-invasive manner. So these include uh, very detailed anthropometric phenotypes, not just height and weight, but limb circumference and skin pigmentation, uh, cardiovascular lung and blood phenotypes, metabolic function, and infectious disease status. And then we're using what we call an integrative omics approach um, to and looking together with uh, the environmental factors, including diet and pathogen exposure and climate, and how these are impacting normal variable traits and disease risk. And today I'm going to tell you about our genomic studies. 
So this is from a study we published a number of years ago, but it remains one of the largest studies of genomic diversity across ethnically diverse populations in Africa. We looked at greater than 3,000 Africans from 121 ethnic groups shown here. And while this is pretty good coverage, you could see there are a lot of gaps. So we're not capturing all the diversity present. And then we looked at a comparative sample of non-Africans. And the first thing we did is look at how much diversity there is. So the height of this bar indicates the uh, level of diversity. And like all studies to date have shown, Africans have the greatest amount of diversity and you see decreasing diversity as you move west to east across Eurasia into East Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. And that's reflecting that migration out of Africa and then a series of founding events as people migrated into other regions. Um, we can also use computational approaches to make inferences about um, individual ancestry. So these uh, genetically, genetic ancestral populations are shown by different colors here. And this plot is made up of different lines. Each line represents a person and they can have ancestry from different uh, populations, ancestral groups. If we look at the bottom at the non-Africans, for example, in blue are people who self-identify as European or Middle Eastern. Um, here are people from India, from Pakistan, East Asia, Oceania and the Americas. But you could see from all these colors in Africa how much diversity there is in Africa uh, compared to the rest of the globe. And in fact, if we repeat the study in Africa, and we've just pooled individuals by language or by geographic region, you could see the tremendous amount of genetic variation in Africa that people in Eastern Africa, Southern, Central, Western, and Northern are divergent genetically. And you can also see a lot of admixture within populations. By looking at these faces, you could see there's also some physiologic and morphological differences. And this is due to um, adaptation to different environments in Africa. So I wanna tell you about um, a study that we did in collaboration with David Reich's group as part of the Simons Genome Diversity Project in which we uh, generated a uh, high coverage whole genome sequence data from 94 individuals from 44 African populations. Uh, Shawa Fan in my lab uh, took the lead on analyzing this data and they speak all of the major language families. So if we make a phylogenetic tree at the end of each of these branches as a population, if the populations are near each other, cluster near each other, they're genetically similar to each other. And what we see is that at the base of this tree, the most basal lineages are those that are in the SOM populations from Southern Africa that speak with cliques. We then have so-called pygmy hunter-gatherers from Central Africa. And then we see populations clustering mainly by geography. So Western and Central Africa and then Eastern Africa. If I were to add non-Africans here, they'd be right here representing a subset basically of the diversity we see in Africa. We can also use computational approaches, coalescent modeling to make inferences about the changes in the effective population size. That's often thought of as the number of breeding individuals uh, going backwards in time. What's interesting is that um, we see this divergence starting around, you know, if we go back, it's around 250,000 years ago, close to the time of origin of modern humans. But if we look between 50,000 and say 100,000 years ago, it's the San and the pygmies who had the largest population size, um, even though today their census size is pretty small. We can also try to make inferences about when these populations diverge from each other. And we and many other groups have shown that the earliest divergences between the San and all other populations. This was well over 100,000 years ago. Some people have said it could have been 200 or 250,000 years ago. If we, the next divergence is between the San and some of these other hunter-gatherer groups like the Hadza and the Sandawe and the Pygmies, and that's dated to around 80,000 years ago. The divergence between people who speak niger kordofanian Nilo-Saharan, Afroasiatic languages was between 20 to about 40,000 years ago. And even between different groups of the San, they diverged 30,000 years ago and the Hadza and Sandawi 20,000 years ago. So there's been this history of very ancient structure in Africa. 
Now for the last part of my talk, I wanna talk about how people have adapted to different environments and two examples of uh, genetic adaptations. The first is going to be um, adaptation to uh, a daring lifestyle. So the ability to drink milk as an adult is due to the expression of an enzyme called lactase fluorazine hydrolase or lactase for short. This enzyme is expressed in the brush border cells um, of the small intestine. In people who have an active uh, version of this enzyme, we call them, we say they have the lactase persistence trait. Uh, they're able to break down the sugar lactose that's found in milk into glucose and galactose, which is rapidly taken up into the bloodstream. But in people who lack that enzyme, because typically after weaning, this enzyme is shut down after birth. Okay, waiting for this to show up. Um, all right, I will just say it. It typically is shut down and they're not able to digest uh, the sugar. It's gonna go into the lower gut and um, get uh, attacked by bacteria and you're gonna have severe intestinal distress, which you could imagine could be deleterious in an African environment. Trying to make this go forward. Hmm. Appear to be stuck. And there we go, it's taking its time. Oh, and now it's going too far forward. So um, what we could see, hopefully this will go back. Okay, sorry about this guys. I'm gonna be speaking and eventually the photos are gonna catch up with me. Uh, this delay is a bit problematic. So um, lactose tolerance is most common in Northern European populations as shown here. It becomes less common in Southern Europe. It's very uncommon in East Asia um, and most of Africa, but it's common in African groups that uh, practice dairying and a uh, lifestyle that we call uh, pastoralism. So um, in 2002, there was a beautiful study done by Lena Peltonen's group in which she identified a mutation associated with lactose tolerance in European populations, but the East Africans that we studied didn't have this mutation. So we gave um, what's called a lactose tolerance test where uh, you drink the sugar lactose and then every 20 uh, minutes you use a, a diabetes blood monitoring kit to measure the level of sugar in the blood. I'm gonna to try to move these ahead. I think, so. I think these images are just so large that it takes a long time. Oh, come on. Yeah, Sarah, I, I think, think the connection to you might also be slowing it down. So let's go to verbal clicking and Megan advancing for you. So if you wanna just tell her okay. one slide. Yep. Okay, so um, we can look at the rise in glucose over um, around a one hour period. And if it's greater than, okay, if it's greater than 1.7 millimolar, we refer to that as lactose tolerant. If it's less than 1.1 millimolar, we refer that to as lactose intolerant. But we can also analyze this as a quantitative trait. And we did so in 470 individuals from Tanzania, Kenya, and Sudan. Next, please. And what we, uh, we identified three novel variants that are associated with lactose tolerance. Next. And they arose independently from the European mutation, which is nearby. These are located in a non-coding region of the MCM6 gene, which is nearby the lactase gene. And we showed that this is acting as an enhancer uh, that are, it's altering these mutations, alter the expression of the lactase gene. Now, what's interesting is that we see, a, and this I should say, these arose independently from the European mutation due to what we call convergent evolution. So the most common variant in East Africa is at position 1410. We see another variant common in the Middle East that we think um, through migration was introduced into East Africa. And then a third variant common in the Horn of Africa. Next, please. We then wanted to know, um, is there a signature of natural selection? And there was a whopping signature, perhaps the strongest that has ever been seen in the human genome. And what we look for is the signature of extended haplotype homozygosity. So if we look at these red bars, these are individuals who have two copies of this mutation associated with lactose tolerance. We genotype 
uh, variants going out about 3 million nucleotides. If they are homozygous going out some distance, we just keep the bar going. And if not, we break the bar. So this homozygosity extends about 2 million base pairs on average in uh, people who have that mutation. But on the ancestral uh, chromosomes, it only extends about 1,800 base pairs. So that's a really striking signature. Based on an estimated rate of decay um, of these haplotypes, we can estimate the age of these mutations. We estimated the European mutation to be between 8,000 to 9,000 years old. We estimated the East African mutation to be between 3,000 to 7,000 years old. Next, please. And next, this corresponds with the um, history of cattle domestication based on the archaeological record, so from cave paintings and from pottery shirts, next please, which shows that it was introduced, um, int it arose around 8,000 to 10,000 years ago in North Africa and the Middle East, but it wasn't introduced into south of the Saharan Desert until around 5,000 years ago, next please, and then was introduced into Southern Africa within the past 2,000 years, next please. Now, uh, there was a really neat paper that came out um, this, this year by, uh, or last year, I guess, by Grillo and colleagues. And they were able to characterize the lipids, the fat from the milk in some of the containers that they use for processing food. And they did this in an area from North Tanzania, Southern Kenya. And they were able therefore to date these that they could say, yes, people were processing milk at this time. And at 5,000 years ago, they had more meat and some grains, but by 3,000 years ago, there was much more of a reliance on um, the milk products. Next, please. And then David Reich's group uh, published a paper in 2019 in which they characterized ancient DNA from over 30 uh, individuals uh, past, who were thought to be pastoralists dated to between 5,000 and 1,200 years ago. Only one individual was found to have the lattice persistence mutation. So these results may imply that what came first was the cultural innovation, um, the technological innovation of cattle domestication. And then these mutations were there and then they rose to high frequency. But we have to treat that with some caution because it's not always easy to characterize the genetic variation in the ancient DNA. And because we don't know all the mutations that are causing this phenotype. Next, please. But this is a great example of gene culture coevolution. The last trait I'm going to tell you about is skin color. Next, please. So in uh, blue here, we're seeing uh, the lov levels of melanin. That's the dark, the pigment in skin that makes it more darkly colored. And we could see that it correlates with the level of UV. Next, please. Which uh, has led people to believe, Just you can just keep going the next few, <laughs> that um, uh, one more, that this is an adaptive trait and that when modern humans left Africa into the higher latitudes, that there was selection for lighter skin uh, to facilitate production of vitamin D, which is synthesized in the skin in response to UV. But in places with high UV close to the equator, there'd be selection for darker skin to prevent uh, skin cancer and folate degradation. Next, please. But all the studies have been done in Europeans next. And so we um, study this in Africans. We uh, use a spectrophotometer. We shine the light under the arm, and that's an area not frequently exposed to sunlight. And from that, based on the wavelength, the reflection, we can infer the melanin levels. And we see a big range. The most lightly pigmented people are the San. And remember, I told you they have the most ancient genetic lineages. Next, next two, and one more. And then we see a range of variation with the most darkly pigmented being the uh, Nilo-Saharan speaking people who originated in South Sudan. Next. We then did a genome-wide association study with a relatively small number of people, only 16, around 1,600, and found eight loci that were associated at genome-wide significance in four regions of the genome. Next, please. I'm going to step through these quickly. So uh, the strongest association was at SLC24A5. That happened to be the first gene ever identified to play a role in skin color in Europeans. And in fact, the Africans have the same non-synonymous variant in this gene um, as seen outside of Africa. 
So the allele associated with the light skin, I'm gonna show that as blue, is at almost 100% frequency in Europe. It's common in Pakistan, parts of India, and it's common in East Africa. Next, please. But we wanted to know, did this arise independently in Africa? So to do that, we construct a haplotype network. So a haplotype is how different variants are arranged along some region of a chromosome. In this case, we're looking at 70,000 nucleotides. Each circle represents a haplotype and the colors represent the proportions of populations in those haplotype, that have those haplotypes. And this haplotype would be very different from this one. This would be more similar. Next, please. And so we find that there's this one common haplotype that we see in Europeans, next please, which is consistent with recent positive selection, but the East African variant is on the same haplotype background, suggesting it was introduced by migration back into Africa. Next, please. I'll go ahead and just do one more after this. Um, so the next variant, the, uh, the next gene we see is called MFSD12. It didn't have a name when we started the study. We're the first people to characterize this gene. Um, it codes for an ion transporter protein. We found two independent associations and the one upstream in a regulatory region, the light associated variant is common in Europe and East Asia, East Africa and the San. Um, but what does this have to do with pigmentation? Next, please. Um, our collaborator knocked this out in the mouse. It has a dramatic impact on pigmentation, coat color in the mouse. So this agouti mouse loses the red yellow color and becomes gray. Now, it has now been shown that this gene is an important risk factor for melanoma. And this was found from just a relatively small number of people in Africa. Next, please. Um, we were able to estimate uh, the age of these mutations using um, a coalescent analysis. This is a gene genealogy. Think of it like a tree. These um, are lineages from outside of Africa. The open circle means that they have the light allele, and this is the dark allele. The point is that the ancestral allele is the one associated with the light skin, and these variants are old, over a million years old. Next, please. Next. So then uh, at DDB1, we found an association. This is a gene that's important for DNA repair in response to UV damage. People who have mutations in this gene or in uh, genes that code for proteins that interact with it have this disease, xeroderma pigmentosum. What does that have to do with pigmentation in humans? Next. We don't know, but it causes the color of tomatoes. <laughs> so it's something to do with pigmentation. We just don't know what. Next, please. And again, we see two independent associations in regions that are enhancers that are regulating gene expression at DDB1. Let's go to the next. Keep going and keep going. And what was interesting is we look for a signature of selection in this region and using something called a Tajima's D statistic, if it's negative, you see a strong signature of selection. And we saw that looking at the thousand genomes uh, populations in Chinese and Europeans. Next. And in fact, it was so strong that it wiped out all the variation almost in this region in Asia for over 500,000 nucleotides. Next. Next. And so this haplotype network, you see this one very long haplotype in Europe. And what's interesting is when you look at this gene genealogy, you see this rapid coalescence outside of Africa at about 60,000 years ago, the time of migration of modern humans out of Africa. We think this is one of the rare examples of a nearly complete selective sweep when modern humans left Africa. Next, please. And the last region is OCA2 and HERC2, known to play a role in skin color in Europeans, but we found independent associations. Next. And these two variants in HERC2 are in regulatory regions that influence expression of OCA2. In OCA2 and exon 10, we found a synonymous variant it was not expressing uh, inter influencing gene expression. You can do the next, please. But it was causing alternative um, splicing. So people with the light associated allele have a shorter transcript, missing exon 10, next please. It codes for a protein, but it's missing the third transmembrane domain. So that protein is really messed up. Next slide. 
Here we see a signature of positive selection that variation is being maintained in the African populations. Next. And when we look at the gene genealogy, indeed, we see a very old time to most recent common ancestry, which is a signature of balancing selection. These two alleles have been maintained a long time. Next. So in summary, um, in half the cases, the alleles, um, the ancestral alleles were those associated with light skin. And when we estimate the age of the mutations, they're typically older than three than the origin of modern humans. Next slide. What does that imply about the origin of skin pigmentation? Um, well, this poor chimp lost its body here. You could see relatively light skin. Anthropologists that I've spoken to said that many chimps have light skin underneath their body here, not all of them, but they speculate that this was the ancestral state. Next, please. And that after modern humans left the forest and went into the savanna, there would have been selection to lose body here for thermal regulation, but then there'd be selection for more darkly pigmented skin. But I argue that given that we see both light and dark alleles in Africa, maybe there was variation in Africa at that time as well. Next. And lastly, I just wanna point out another really interesting observation that the only other place in the world we see the variant associated with dark skin is in South uh, Asia and Australia, Melanesia, two places where you also see darkly pigmented skin. Anthropologists, many had thought that this trait arose due to independent evolution, like at lactose tolerance uh, mutation. But here we show that at least at these genes, uh, they originated from Africa and they came, were introduced by migration out of Africa and were maintained due to selection. Next. So in conclusion, people often ask me, are humans still evolving? I'm gonna say the answer is yes, they are. Last is just my thank yous. One more. Okay. Well, the last one. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who contributed and to the funding agencies. Glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sarah. That was that was great. That was amazing. Um, I am going to. Um, I think that the way we're doing it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ashley or Megan, is that I'm gonna filter people's questions. Is that is that right? And repeat people's questions or are we gonna have people from the audience ask those questions? Uh, you can start with one to kick it off. We see questions are coming into the Q&A panel and you can um, call out to either, you can filter directly from Q&A or call out to Alexa to read one for you. No, I, I'm happy to read them. I've, and if you, if I'm missing things, let me know. But I'll, I'll read them rather than having the person who asked them read them, if that's okay. So, um, my uh, one, there's a question from John Bar Barbuto, um, and the question is: the world now pivots on human behavior more than it pivots on human morphology. Um, have we done much investigation of behavioral diversity around across time and the world? I think the, another version of the question is. Um, what is the prospect for uh, the work that you talked about was about uh, pigmentation and physiology. Um, what is the prospect of gaining insight about behavioral adaptation in the spirit of brain evolution and trying to understand those types of traits? Well, okay, one of the things is that's often in the realm of the archeologist um, who are looking at what they can see as evidence of modern human behavior and how that evolved. We can look at things like changes in brain size, but people like you, David, can also look at ancient DNA. One thing that I can do, I don't look at ancient DNA, but I look at modern traits and I'm not looking at brain related traits, but people who are either in humans or in model organisms are identifying genetic variants that play a role in, in brain related traits. Once you've identified them, you could then go look at these ancient DNA samples, whether it's Neanderthals or Denisovans, you know, ancient modern humans, and maybe see if they're present or what the frequency is. I mean, I'm curious of what your thoughts are about that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the modern variation that you are characterizing is the only place, not, not or almost the only place where you're going to be able to really characterize phenotype. 
So for example, if you understand the genetic underpinnings of a trait like uh, lactase persistence or pigmentation, or you have some kind of genetic predictors of behavioral traits or cognitive traits, which are much more difficult to understand because they're so environmentally dependent and you know, manifest themselves differently in different places in very, very profound ways but are already beginning to be identified in some populations, such as traits that affect, for example, people's success at number of years people attend school. What that means is very confusing, but that's- Yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm a, I personally am still somewhat skeptical of these. Yeah, yeah. You're right. I mean, they, they, they seem real, but how do, what, do we, what does it mean? I mean, like, yes. okay, they had a few months more of, of education. Some people say there are a lot of confounders. And I do want to point out that for- what many of the traits that make us modern humans, we all share, right? This is in all populations. And people have to remember that some people think that, well, you know, these, um, you know, keep in mind, people are evolving in all places of the world. And even people who are maintaining a hunter gatherer lifestyle, they're developing new technologies, new skills, their brain is still evolving. And I want people to understand that, 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 you know, we share more than we are likely to be different in many of these uh, behavioral traits. Completely agree. And, and it's actually a very, very important uh, point to emphasize. Uh, and, you know, in, in fact, you know, the, the trait I mentioned, you know, is, is changing in some populations, for example, in Iceland, opposite to the direction you might expect if you think that people are evolving toward increasing education. In fact, the genetic underpinning of, 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 of this trait, which of course didn't exist, you know, two, 3,000 years ago, because people didn't go to school. In fact, it's people uh, now in Iceland are predicted to, by this trait to have fewer years of that succeed less well in school than people 100 years ago due to clear natural selection effects, but what it's for is not clear. Um, I wanted to switch to another question from Ben Slivka, um, uh, who asks, uh, the 2019 FAN study with 94 individuals, uh, 44 African populations, is that a large enough sample size to make the definitive conclusions about ancestry lineage than you presented? It sounds pretty small. So, <laughs> well, okay. So yes and no. So I know David, you were, we we had this discussion actually when you were putting this paper, this study together. Do we want two individuals per population? Do we want a population size? You know, a larger population. It depends on the questions that you're trying to address, right? And so if you're looking, I think the question asked about sort of um, phylogenies and lineages, it's not bad. <laughs> you know, you actually can do a lot. I, I think you would agree with even just a couple of individuals. I personally think we're going to learn a lot more when we look at larger population sizes, and we're already doing that. Because when you do that, one, you can look at frequency of traits or, or variants that play a role in different traits. You can look at the, the allele frequency distributions in the populations. And it, I think it allows you to make inferences about what is likely we know to be much more complex demographic history than I presented. I presented a simplified version, but the reality is that populations were dividing, migrating over, you know, 50,000, 100,000 years ago, interbreeding, separating, migrating, interbreeding. It's very, very um, difficult and computationally intensive to try to reconstruct the realistic complex demographic history in Africa. It's something that we and others are trying to do, but it might actually take better computational me methods to do this because it's just taking a really long time when we try to model very uh, complex scenarios. And then the other thing is that there's some evidence from our group and others that there could have been archaic introgression in Africa. No reason to think that this was only happening outside of Africa right, with Neanderthals and Denisovans, but we haven't found this ancestral, you know, any fossils from what this um, population would have been, and so it's very hard to detect those regions in the genome, but that throws you off a little bit too, because some of the genome might be shaped by these archaic integrations as well. Great. Um, another question uh, from Charles, Charles Dillahunt. Um, do you have any insights uh, into the um, uh, long distance running traits, or at least the, uh, in uh, some people in the Rift Valley in Kenya and Ethiopia, for example? I don't, but I would love to know. I think that'd be very interesting. I mean, we are interested in looking at things like the adaptation of height in those populations because they're very, they have a very tall and thin body type. 
Some people have argued that this might be a trade that enables them to sort of go over these very long distances in pretty arid conditions. Um, this is something that we would like to look at in the future to try to find that uh, data. It's going to require actually doing some physiologic um, exercise <laughs> experiments where if we could, and we may be able to do this to actually look at metabolism, you know, in these populations and try to correlate it with genetic traits. So we, we don't know yet. An another question from Timothy Winey. Um, if uh, evolution takes place over long time spans, how could uh, people evolve to digest milk over comparatively short time, sc time spans? So evolution can take place over very short time periods. Um, and it depends on what the trait is. Maybe you're thinking in terms of, you know, it might take a while for brain size <laughs> to get much bigger in the hominin lineage, that's true, or, you know, development of bipedalism and things like that. But we have very good evidence that there can be very rapid evolution um, of traits under strong selection. So lactose tolerance is one of the great examples. There's also, of course, um, genes or variants that play a role in resistance to infectious disease, particularly malaria in Africa. They rise to very high frequency. Sometimes they can cause other types of disease when, you know, in, and often when you move out of an African environment, there's an example, I guess, of the EDAR mutation in uh, Asians, East Asians, that plays a role in the hair phenotype, but it might also influence mammary gland development. And that's another important thing to point out, actually, <laughs> that so many of these variants or genes that are under selection may have pleiotropic effects, meaning that they're influencing multiple traits. So I mentioned that gene at DDB1, that region, we see this strong selective sweep. Was that due to skin color? I kind of doubt it. <laughs> I think it probably has something to do with the function of these genes in that region. And they do many different things. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's why it can be very difficult sometimes to figure out what was actually the selective force. You can sometimes see that signature, but we don't know. Lactose tolerance was one of the rare examples where you could actually link that together. So that partially addresses a question that uh, Chris Walsh asked you, uh, wrote, it looks like DDB1 is involved in UV damage, DNA mm -hmm. repair. Do you think this change drives pigmentation change or might be a compensatory change to lighter skin? I, I, I'll, all I know is I think it's fascinating <laughs> that it plays a role in response to UV and plays a role in pigmentation and that there could be some kind of co-evolution of, you know, that these co-evolved or something, I don't know. But at the same time, you know, this has been playing a role in pigmentation in plants and the tomato. So it's been, it seems to play that role for a long time. We don't know, but what we're doing now is we're doing a much more detailed study in that region because some of those regulatory uh, regions interact with other genes. And so we're doing things like looking at chromatin looping to look at what other genes they're interacting with. And then maybe trying to do um, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, knockouts and modifications to figure out what these genes are doing. So I don't know how much more time I have left, but I think only one or two more minutes, is that right? Um, so uh, there's a question from Anna Dorakova, um, who uh, loved the lecture and says, um, how is it just from a population genetic perspective that people kept uh, sort of the dark pigmentation phenotypes in places like Austromelanesia or in India? Like, how is it that, that it's preserved over time? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, it, you know, it's a really interesting question. I, I am intrigued by this. I was not expecting this, to be honest. If you had asked me, I would have said that there's completely independent mutations in those regions that arose and, you know, independently and gave them some resistance to, um, you know, protection from UV. Now we know that some of these were introduced by migration. And again, things can be maintained a very long time if there's strong selection for them. So if they move to this region with strong UV, there can be strong selection. I suspect that there are new mutations in that region. I do suspect that there are some that we're going to find that are specific to that region that also arose. And keep in mind, skin color is a complex trait. It's a little bit simpler. It's a lot simpler than height, <laughs> but there are a number of genes involved and we still don't know entirely. What's almost more interesting to me is why did it disappear everywhere else? <laughs> you know, yeah. why did that, again, why did that selective sweep happen or we lost those dark alleles and so many others? 
That, so that was awesome. I think it's time to move on to the new speaker. Um, I think that this case of pigmentation and lactose persistence really teaches us how evolution happens in these cases where we can really wrestle it in detail and take advantage of the many independent laboratories and theaters of evolution that exist around the world, especially in Africa. So I think that the, these findings like these very, very deep and uh, persistent mutations is, is quite surprising actually to me and, and um, comes from the empirical investigation of these traits. Okay, I'm gonna switch it over to Mike Greenberg uh, to introduce um, Liron Carmel. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yes, thanks, thanks very much for a wonderful talk. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speech speaker, Liron Carmel. Liron is a professor of computational biology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And he received his master's degree in physics from the Technion of the Israel Institute of Technology and subsequently the PhD in applied mathematics from the Weizmann Institute of Science also in Israel. He then pursued postdoctoral studies in molecular evolution at the National Institutes of Health in the US. Uh, Liron is studying a host of topics that relate to molecular evolution and is particularly interested in human evolution and in understanding um, through uh, the study of DNA and epigenetics what makes us human. He's a founder of a, a particular subject called paleoepigenetics, a technology that um, reconstructs epigenetic signals in ancient genomes, thus giving us information about ancient gene regulation, not just the DNA sequence, but the regulation of genes, in particular in bone. And I think um, he's really developed uh, a brilliant approach to understanding uh, methyl modifications of DNA as they um, occur in ancient genomes and then tell us something about gene regulation. His presentation today is titled Paleoepigenetics, the use of ancient DNA methylation patterns to study human evolution. And like um, with the first talk, we will have um, a 30-minute presentation and then about 15 minutes of discussion and uh, question and answer after the talk, which will focus on um, uh, aspects of uh, uh, human evolution that are regulated by epigenetics. So, uh, Liron, thanks for coming today. Good day, everybody, and thank you, Mike, for this wonderful introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, beautiful meeting. I would have preferred to be physically now in Seattle, but that's what we have for now. So my talk today will be divided into three parts. In the first part, I will uh, give an introduction to a question that is one of the main um, drivers of my research, which is to identify the genetics underpinning of human specific traits and especially looking at evolutionary changes in gene regulation. Then in the second part, uh, I will uh, show our approach to study the evolution of gene regulation in the very recent evolutionary history of, of humans. And I will briefly survey uh, two works that, uh, that uh, had been recently published um, demonstrating this approach and what it tells us on about the evolution of our skeletal system. And in the last part, uh, given that this is a brain focused um, meeting, I will um, show you um, a work that is still in progress, therefore unpublished, where, we, uh, where I will show you how we go beyond bones and try to make predictions on regulatory changes in genes in other systems like the brain. <clears throat> so let's begin. Um, so we are studying uh, the very recent evolution of modern human. And in particular, we uh, compare modern human to our closest evolutionary relatives, the archaic humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans, from which we split roughly 600,000 years ago. 
and to think uh, revolution in uh, the ability to sequence ancient DNA, we have high quality genomes of both uh, these archaic humans and we can carry out comparative studies. And uh, the easiest way to compare uh, these human groups is to uh, look at um, changes in protein sequence. However, these changes tend to be very rare. And also when they occur, they bear usually very little information on, on the biological or phenotypic differences between these human groups. And it is commonly accepted that many of the uh, phenotypic differences between these human groups are attributed to changes in gene regulation. However, RNA uh, rarely survives in, um, in ancient material and none has survived so far in Neanderthal or Denisovan samples, so we cannot have a direct access to, to RNA. And therefore we have to come up with other methods to infer uh, on changes in gene regulation. And therefore these questions on how can we use ancient genomes to say something about changes in gene regulation, this question has become one of the uh, major and most important challenges in the field. And our approach to this is to look at DNA methylation, which is an, uh, an epigenetic mark. Uh, uh, with, this is a chemical modification uh, that cytosines C can undergo uh, when they are usually when they are in CPG context. So cytosines can be either methylated or unmethylated. And the thing is that DNA methylation is known to be strongly associated with levels of uh, uh, with levels of RNA of genes, especially in the promoter region, when where there is a known uh, strong and negative correlation between the level of promoter methylation and the level of RNA uh, level. So, in the absence of uh, direct measurements of RNA in ancient data, we reasoned that if we can reconstruct the pre-mortem DNA methylation of these ancient individuals, this would be our best proxy for the levels of RNA. And the way we do it is that we harness natural degradation processes in ancient DNA. And when DNA ages, the predominant chemical degradation process is called deamination. And it, it occurs uh, to cytosines again. And luckily, uh, it works a little bit differently for uh, cytosines that are methylated and uh, cytosines that are not methylated. So if a methylated cytosine goes through deamination, it becomes a timine. Whereas uh, if it is a, an unmethylated cytosine that go, goes through the amination, it becomes uracils, which uh, normally are not present in DNA. Now, uh, oftentimes uh, when you prepare ancient DNA for sequencing, uh, you apply a chemical protocol uh, during this library preparation phase that uh, removes uracils from the reads. And this introduces an asymmetry between methylated and unmethylated cytosines that we can uh, use. And the way we do it is as follows. Imagine that these are DNA sequences of a living Neanderthal, and just schematically imagine that here is a region with high methylation, meaning that many of the cytosines here are methylated. And this is a region with low methylation. And then this Neanderthal dies. And after 50,000 years, you retrieve the DNA. And this is how it looks like. So uh, the amination is a stochastic process. So some of the Cs in this region became timines, whereas some of the Cs in this region became uracils. Now we want to prepare this DNA for sequencing. And during this preparation, we remove the uracils. So what we reasoned is that we can simply look at CPG positions in modern human and compute in the Neanderthal sequences what, we, what is called the C2T ratio, which is just 
the fraction of T's that we see in these positions. So what we expect to see that in this region, we will get some appreciable values of C to T ratio, whereas in this region, we will get negligible values of the C to T ratio. And indeed, we developed a way to reconstruct DNA methylation based on this C to T ratio, which we were able to show that it gives you an accurate genome-wide reconstruction of pre-motem DNA methylation. And usually you see that uh, modern and alkyl humans are very similar in the methylation pattern. Here you see an example. This is a part of a chromosome of a modern human. And you see here uh, DNA methylation values. These are measured methylation in present day sample. And it is color coded from low methylation in green to high methylation in red. And this is how uh, the reconstruction look like in this region. And what you see is that they generally match very nicely. <clears throat> And of course, what we are interested in is those regions where they are different. They, these are called differentially methylated regions or DMARs, like the one that you see here, where we have different uh, DNA methylation patterns between modern and archaic humans. Um, so what we did is that we uh, generated a very large uh, database of bone DNA methylation. It includes several archaic humans, several anatomically modern humans that are ancient, and therefore we applied the same reconstruction algorithm. And we added to this many DNA methylation measured, directly measured in present day humans and chimpanzees. And this data uh, allowed us to identify what we call lineage specific DMRs. And you see an example here in the upper panel. You see methylation levels are here on the y-axis and along the x-axis, you see the different samples. So in this case, this is a DMR that is uh, derived in a modern humans. All the modern humans are the blue samples. This includes all the ancient ones, the modern ones measured in different technologies. You see that consistently, regard, regardless of you know, what sex uh, are these individuals or their health condition, consistently you see that methylation levels in modern humans distinctively differ from methylation levels in Neanderthals, Denisovans, and chimpanzee. So this is the case of what we call lineage specific DMR, meaning this is a region whose methylation is different between the different human lineages. Using our uh, data set, we are also able to identify other kinds of differentially methylated regions. For example, here you see an example of bone specific methylation. And here you see an example of sex specific methylation. And given our data set, we are able to exclude all these DMRs and to be left only with DMRs that are lineage specific. And so doing this process, we were able to identify thousands of uh, such differentially methylated regions. And we were able to polarize and say when along the uh, long evolution, the methylation change happen. And uh, what I'm going to do next is to show you two examples of what you can do with, with this information. In the first example, we only focused on these close to 900 DMRs where the methylation change happened only in modern humans after we split from the Neanderthals and Denisovans, meaning these are methylation changes that are derived in modern humans. And they are associated with uh, close to 600 genes. And then we use a tool that we developed in, in my lab that is called Gene Organizer. And this tool links genes with body parts that they affect in evolution. So if you plug in this tool your list of 600 genes, you get a heat map of the human body showing which body parts are enriched within this list of genes. So what we see is that when we plug in those 600 genes, where again, these are genes where the methylation change is unique to modern human, 
you see an amazing enrichment in our voice box. This is by far the most enriched body part in this list of genes. And indeed, we were able to identify a, a network of five genes uh, that uh, uh, form the basis. They, they all affect both, both the voice and the face, and that they are responsible for shaping the anatomy of our voice box and of the face. What you see here uh, along the x-axis, you see the position along a chromosome, and along the y-axis, you see a kind of a measure of the density of methylation changes in this region. And you see that we see very, very clear peaks around five genes, and all these genes are developmental genes that are related to the development of the skeletal system and uh, the voice box. And this is an example of one of these genes. This is NFIX. And here you see an example of how a, dif a DMR, a differentially methylated region, looks like in this gene. You see that in this region, the methylation is low in archaic humans and chimpanzee and is high in modern humans, whether you look at ancient modern humans or on, uh, or on present day ones. Uh, which suggests that there was a hypermethylation of this region only in the lineage leading to modern humans. And we can show that in this region, methylation is negatively correlated to expression, and therefore this change uh, suggests downregulation of NFIX in modern humans compared to al archaic humans and chimpanzee. And indeed, we were able to show um, that this network of five genes is uh, uh, the genetic basis of uh, both our face and voice box anatomy. And we make two claims. First, that the anatomy of our, our voice box is not identical to that of archaic humans. It is uh, anatomically different. And second, these genes affect simultaneously both the shape of the face and the voice box, meaning that we suggest that the changes in our face, mostly the uh, retraction backwards of the face, and the changes in the larynx were coupled. In another example, we used the entire collection of DMRs that we have identified between the human groups. And we wanted uh, to ask the question whether we can provide anatomical insights on how the Denisovan looks like. So the previous work that I've just shown you showed us the, the, uh, the amount of anatomical information that uh, is carried within these uh, the, uh, differential methylate, differentially methylated regions. And the Nisovans, whereas the genome is known with, uh, with high quality, the problem is that there are very, very few physical remains of these uh, humans. And what you see here in this slide is more or less everything that we have to date, including uh, this pinky bone, including several teeth, and including lower jaw. And that's about it. So combining these physical remains with genetics, we can, just, we can say a few things. For example, they had fairly large teeth. They had a protruding lower jaw. We know by the place where these remains were found that they lived in North and in East Asia, based on the fact that the uh, Denisovan genome contributed to populations like Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians. We, they likely to, to have been living also in Southeast Asia. And uh, Denisovan alleles are uh, found uh, in, in uh, Tibetans helping them to adapt to high altitudes and in Inuits, helping them to adapt to cold climates, suggesting that maybe Denisovans were adapted to living in such conditions uh, uh, before. Um, based on the genome, we can also um, uh, predict that they had fairly dark eyes, skin and hair, but that's about it. And we wanted to know whether uh, our approach can, uh, can, can do more than this. And what we did is that we relied on monogenic 
uh, on databases on monogenic diseases where we can uh, see the effect of loss of functions of genes. And then you uh, parallel this loss of function to reduced expression of the genes. And therefore we can, uh, we can predict the phenotypic effect of a reduction in the expression of genes in different uh, human lineages. And this led us uh, to offer a, a first uh, anatomical profile of the Denisovan. We have tested the algorithm by um, running it uh, and predicting the anatomical profiles of lineages whose anatomy is known. We used it on Neanderthal, we used it and on chimpanzees, and we show that it works with more than 80% accuracy, and therefore we, uh, we applied it to Denisovans, and we got uh, their skeletal profile. This is here an example of what you see when you look at the uh, change, predicted changes in the skull. At the upper panel, you see uh, modern humans. At the lower panel, you see Neanderthals. And in the middle, you see Denis Denisovans. And here are the different traits that we predict. And the way you read it, look, for example, at this trait, the forehead height. So this is a trait. And here you see uh, how this trait in the Nisovan look like compared to both modern humans, which is the MH and Neanderthals. In this case, this feature is reduced in the Nisovans compared to modern humans and is the same as Neanderthals, suggesting that they had more slanted forehead uh, than us, just like Neanderthals. So in many of these traits, you do expect the Nisovans to resemble Neanderthals, but in some cases, you see unique Denisovan properties. One of the more interesting one is this here, which is called the biparietal width, which is basically the largest distance, uh, uh, lateral distance in your skull. So it means that they had a very wide skull. And this is particularly interesting given a very uh, significant findings from 2017 from uh, the site of Shuchang in China, where the upper cranial parts of these individuals were found. These are humans that lived a very long time ago, more than 100,000 years ago, and their association with specific lineages was not known. And we were able to show that our seven out of eight features observed in these cranial parts fit our Denisovan profile, including uh, that they had very wide skulls. So of course, this is not a proof, but this is uh, uh, gives some evidence that maybe these individuals were also Denisovans. And uh, this work was published, and this is, a, 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 of course, an artist, imp artist impression on, of the Denisovans based on our um, skeletal reconstructions. So uh, in these two works, I showed you how we uh, use the uh, differentially methylated regions and changes in uh, DNA methylation to infer uh, on changes in the skeletal system. And why skeletal? Because DNA, because ancient DNA is extracted mainly from bones and because DNA methylation is very much tissue specific. And it is even, it is even part of, uh, of a, a, it plays a pivotal role in, in, in cellular identity. For example, if I look at DNA methylation in my brain and in gene brain, they are more similar to each other than in my brain and my liver. So DNA methylation is very much tissue specific. And since we reconstruct DNA methylation in bones, uh, this is the easiest uh, body part to, to focus on. But of course, we are interested in more body parts, uh, like the brain. And we wanted next to ask the question whether we can take these differentially methylated regions, DMRs, in bone and try to predict which of them are also valid in other tissues. And the idea behind it is that if you look at the developmental tree, basically you have a reset, more or less. Uh, it, it, it's a very large reset of DNA methylation signals at the very, at very early embryogenesis. And then DNA methylation builds 
along this uh, 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 during uh, the development. Uh, so, so you see a building of DNA methylation along this developmental tree. And so if, for example, that we are able to determine that a certain DMO that we see, the DNA methylation change happened here, it means that this is bone specific or tissue specific, and therefore it would be predictive on brain because brain in this case would not follow the same pattern as in bone. Uh, DNA methylation that happened here, for example, during development, it means that methylation change in bone might be informative on methylation change in lungs. And DNA methylation that happened here very early during embryogenesis, it means that bone might also be informative on brain and that the same methylation change in bone might also be valid in brain. So this is uh, the basic idea. And the way we approach it is that we look at pairs of tissues in this example, bone and brain, brain and then every methylation change that happened before the developmental split, we call this a fundamental change. And in this case, it would be the same change in bone and brain. Whereas uh, changes that happened after the developmental split will be called tissue specific changes and they will affect only one of the tissues. And what we uh, try to do next is to, is to see whether we can take a DMR in bone and predict whether we can say if it's uh, tissue specific or fundamental. In either case, we are able to provide a prediction in brain, but it might be that we are unable to say whether it is tissue specific or fundamental. So the way we do it is as follows. So we look at a pair of tissues. One tissue that we call all, we observe it in all three lineages. And the lineages that we are talking about, one of them in this example, you can think of modern humans is called the reference. Another in this example is the outgroup. In this example is the chimpanzee is called the outgroup. And then there is the target. Uh, in this case, Neanderthal. So one of the tissues, we have information on DNA methylation in all three lineages, but in the other tissue, we have information which is called partial because we have information only in the reference and in the outgroup, and we want to predict what happens in this tissue here in the target. And the, uh, the idea behind it is as follows, and it is best explained by an example. Look here at an example of a bone where we see low methylation in chimpanzee, low methylation in Neanderthal, and high methylation in humans. So this is a DMR in our study. And then suppose that we observe high methylation in the brain of both chimpanzee and modern human. Now, if you apply here, parsimonious considerations, uh, 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 the parsimony principle, you would conclude that in this case, the change that happened in modern humans is tissue specific. So in this case, you will be able to predict that the brain in Neanderthals had high methylation. But if, you, if bones are still the same, but you observe here in chimpanzee low methylation, then using parsimony, you would conclude that the change here in modern human was fundamental. And in this case, uh, uh, the met you predict that the methylation in the uh, Neanderthal brain would be a uh, low methylation, just like in chimpanzee. And you, you can do it uh, in a more general way. And you can look at different configurations of the tissue all. Um, so you can think of different configurations that you identify DMRs in this tissue, and you can look at all different configurations in the tissue partial, where we have information only on the reference and the outgroup. So you see here that in some cases, we are able to, to predict fundamental changes here and here. In some cases, we are able to identify tissue specific changes, and in other cases, we are unable to determine whether it was tissue specific or fundamental. 
It means that in some configurations, we are able to use bone in order to make predictions on other tissues like brain. So how would you test such an idea? What we do is, uh, since we are lacking the ground truth for Neanderthal, what we do is we test this idea, this idea on a different uh, setup. In this case, we uh, use modern humans as reference, macaque as an outgroup, and chimpanzee as the target. And, and we try to predict uh, uh, the methylation uh, 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 status in chimpanzee, and then we can test again the measurement, measured methylation and evaluate the performance of our algorithm. And notice that this tree has much deeper roots than that tree, meaning that divergence times here are much, uh, 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 much deeper. And it means that if that it's much harder for the algorithm to work in this case. So the performance that we get would be an underestimate of the uh, performance when we want to predict the patterns in Neanderthals. And so in order to evaluate the performance, we collect data on these three uh, lineages, humans, chimpanzee, and macaque, as in as many tissues as we can. Uh, bone data we internally generate, but all the other data we, we collect from published works. And uh, the third thing is to optimize the algorithm. So we have, um, we, we, we used two tissues for which we have a lot of data, bone and blood, uh, to optimize the parameters of the algorithm. And the two main parameters are here, you see along this axis. This is a parameter used to, de to determine what is the right configuration in the tissue all. And this parameter is used to determine what is the right configuration in the tissue partial. And you see that the, the performance of the algorithm is quite robust to uh, uh, the values of these parameters. And it shows much higher precision than uh, random permutations. And then we uh, applied the algorithm to pairs of tissues where one is used as all, where you have the information and you try to predict the methylation state in the other. And in all cases, the precision of our algorithm is very stable around 80% precision compared to roughly 30% that uh, you expect just by chance. And uh, we still have uh, troubles with uh, uh, using brain here uh, because we are very limited in the number of individuals that for which we have data, uh, but we are working on this. So to sum up, uh, I've shown you um, a, a way that we use in order to infer differentially methylated regions, DMRs in bones, and we can uh, identify methylation changes, which we relate to changes in gene activity patterns. And first, we used it to probe evolutionary changes in the skeletal system showing the unique, the emergence of the unique anatomy of our voice box and offering the first anatomical reconstruction of the Denisovans. And then I showed you how we can extrapolate to other tissues using the developmental tree and um, how we can uh, ad identify dif uh, differential methylation in other tissues like the brain. And I want to add, uh, end by thanking uh, the many collaborators. I'm very lucky to have many uh, amazing collaborators. I described here several projects, so I have many names here. Uh, and a special thanks to David Gochman, who is a former PhD student in the lab, who led most of the skeletal analysis, and to Yoav Matov, who is a current PhD uh, a student and who is leading the brain related analysis. Thank you all for listening. So, uh, Liron, thanks for a really fascinating talk. I have a, a couple of questions myself, and then um, we also have um, a few from the audience that I'd like um, you to entertain. Um, the first thought I've had is we heard in Sarah's 
talk that each of us in the room uh, differs from one another by about three million um, nucleotides, if I got that right. And I'm wondering a couple of things about the ancient um, Denisovans and the Neanderthal. If there was a similar level of uh, variation from one individual to another, and also what about methylation? And then finally, the last part of the question is, it wasn't quite clear to me, but if you were to isolate bone from the jaw, extract from the jaw versus a leg bone, for example, is the methylation pattern different? And can you see differences there? Yeah, so, so these are many questions. I hope I will remember what you have asked. I'll, I'll help if necessary. So, so uh, first about uh, variation. So yes, so DNA methylation is highly variable. And it, it, it varies in different, um, in different loci, um, responding to many factors like health condition, diet, uh, temperatures, uh, even you know, psychological stress and other things. So there are many, many loci uh, where DNA is more volatile and you would like to have means to uh, being able to identify changes that really characterize changes between human uh, groups and tell them apart, set them apart from uh, these uh, changes that are just uh, based on many other factors that leads to DNA variability. However, uh, there is a huge difference in the behavior of these two types of variability. So if you look at, uh, um, at works that try to measure variability in DNA methylation as a result of changing different factors in your lifestyle, uh, you would normally get that these are very tiny, you will get very significant results, but with tiny effect size. Some, in many cases, 2% difference in methylation, 5% difference in methylation. Only in rare, very rare cases, you are going to see changes in a more than 10% methylation. When we look for DMAS, we are looking at a totally uh, different uh, domain, and we only look for uh, the uh, methylation changes that are at least 50% methylation change, basically shifting you from being hypomethylated to hypermethylated or vice versa. So these changes do not occur due to you know, natural variability and things like lifestyle. So, so this is our focus. And uh, th then you asked about, you see, I forgot. I guess I, I, I was curious to know about variations in methylation in the bone from one region yeah. versus yeah. another. If you can learn something, about, is that how you learn something about the development of a structure? Yeah, so there is viability within bones and actually using our database, we are able to identify a little bit of this variability. But bone is a very special case between because there is a certain, um, a, a very unique feature of bone. And the, this unique feature is that most of your bones in the body are of mesodermal origin, whereas those in the skull are mostly of ectodermal origin. I see. Yes, so, may, so this may, so first, First thing that in my lab now, when we generate um, whole genome bisulfite sequencing, meaning we measure DNA methylation, we use both hip bones, which are of mesodermal origin, and we use uh, powder uh, from skulls, actually leftovers from uh, uh, skull surgeries. Um, that when we get the powder, and so we are able to measure methylation also in the skull. Uh, in the skull region, which, so uh, at first, the first thought is that maybe if you look at uh, bones that come from the skull, they might be more predictive on brain than bones that come from your leg, for example. However, uh, well, we don't know yet, but this is uncertain, given that at least in, at the level of RNA expression, it seems that there is a convergence between these two uh, germline at uh, germ layer origins and that uh, and that bone that comes from the skull shows similar RNA uh, level patterns as bone that come from mesodermal origin. 
Very interesting. So uh, I guess I have one more and then I'll turn it over to the audience. And that is, I noticed in the earlier in the talk you um, talked about a gene called NFIX. And I think you said that it's, it's hypermethylated in us relative to um, uh, the Neanderthal and the Denisovans. And so what that might suggest is that that gene is expressed at a lower level of, in us. And, and, and one of the things that I'm wondering or uh, is, is, would that be considered a fundamental gene? Because I know that gene functions in, um, in neural differentiation in terms of the formation of radial glia. So you might predict something about how many neurons are made on the basis of how much that gene is expressed in the precursors that give rise to the brain. So is that a uh, is that um, something you can speak to? So you ask whether the changes in NFIX are fundamental changes. Yes, yes. Would you see it? Would you expect to see it in the brain as well as um, in and and bone? Well, I don't know how it behaves in brain, so this would uh -huh. be an excellent uh, excellent things to test because in this work we were uh, focusing on the on the skeletal system, uh -huh. and we looked at expression patterns of this gene in chondrocytes because there are uh, uh, lots of uh, cartilage in the voice box. We haven't looked at brain, but this could be a, a very interesting to look at it. Anyway, I, yeah, I guess I'm, what I'm suggesting is that since that gene is known to regulate the the number of glia cells versus neurons, it might be that if, and if you mutate it, you get fewer neurons. It might be that by methylating it in the brain, it leads to a change in the size of the brain. Um, yeah, that's kind of a crazy we, idea. Anyway, yeah, I should, so, so go we ahead. Can test it and, we, and if we see that it is a fundamental change, then uh, yes, indeed, it, it, it might suggest that it, it, it has a lower expression in, in human brain. So. We have to see this. Now, I think we have some some more time, yes? So so I'm going to um, pose some questions that are from the audience. I'll read them. And I'm going to start with the most recent question. So please, um, just because it's a little easier, so folks, please bear with me. So Charles Laird asks, have you been able to compare epigenetic age using Horvath's method with temporal age estimated from bone parameters? Did Neanderthal and Denisovans show more rapid epigenetic aging, for example? Yes, so we, we applied Horvath. So Horvath's uh, clock is, is a multi-tissue clock, so it's not uh, exclusively for bone. And we, uh, we, we applied it. And you do expect to get some reduced accuracy, given that uh, the, when we reconstruct DNA methylation, we don't get um, a base per resolution of DNA methylation, but we get a regional methylation. It's like a, a smooth signal of methylation. So you do expect to some reduced accuracy. And indeed we get given uh, a few years uh, uh, give and take, we got uh, to the same conclusions that you uh, that, that are based on physical anthropology for both the Neanderthal and the Denisovan. Hmm. Now, it says here that Christina Jarvis is going to answer this question live. Is that? Is oh, that... We were just marking it as answered. Continue oh, on. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, so another question um, that comes from Esra Karaska is what comes first, expression or methylation changes? Um, yeah, so, so that, that's a very good question. And this is an, uh, there is an inconclusive answer. I want before I answer this, I want to emphasize that it's it's not it's not affecting what we do because uh, what we do is that we treat DNA methylation as a marker for differential expression, regardless of who came first, whether it was methylation, whether it was expression. Now, if you look at the literature, there are cases where you see that DNA methylation changes drive changes in gene expression and then they would come first. But there are many other cases where you see that changes in gene expression eventually lead to, for example, methylation or unmethylation, uh, or unmethylation of the promoter. And in this case, methylation comes later. So bo both ways. There are examples for both uh, ways, and but it doesn't matter because 
the links between DNA methylation and expression still remain that way or the other. So from Gene Robinson, it's, he says, excellent talk, Liron. Is it possible to use what's known about the neurobiology of speech together with your results on voice box evolution to predict methylation patterns for specific genes in ancient samples? That's a tough one. Yeah, no, I, I uh, it's, can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, is it possible to use what's known about the neurobiology of speech, presumably regulated by this voice box, together with your results on voice box evolution to predict methylation patterns in the ancient? Yeah, so, um, so the thing is that uh, many of, so, so what we have been doing is that we have been looking at um, what is known about differential expression and voice box anatomy. So not much is known about uh, linking uh, DNA methylation changes and voice box anatomy. Much more is known about changes in gene expression and anatomy, and we have definitely used this in our study. For example, you talked before about NFIX, which has a reduced expression in modern humans compared to archaic humans. But if you reduce expression even farther, you get to, to a human disease, uh, uh, Marshall-Smith syndrome, which results in uh, abnormalities in the voice box. So we have used all this, informa all this information on abnormalities to the voice box based on human diseases as part of our study design. So I have, I think, what might be a, a, a relatively um, straightforward question for a change, and that is, um, you talked about methylation of promoters. I'm wondering about enhancers, and which are really thought to be the determinants of tissue-specific gene regulation. And if you can um, assess methylation of enhancers in the bone, which might be brain enhancers, they'd be methylated and thereby inactive. And on the basis of that, maybe make some suggestions as to the enhancers that were working or not working in um, in uh, the um, in the Neanderthal and the Denisovan. Yes, most definitely. So uh, DNA methylation changes in enhancers are very informative on gene regulation. In bones, we've been looking at it a lot. In fact, some of the DMRs that we identify in our work on voice box are located in known enhancers in, uh -huh. in bones. Yeah, and also you can just look at large scale studies of, for example, CHIPSEC that you measure um, uh, histone modifications that are associated with enhancers and you find uh, enrichment of DNA methylation changes within this region, strongly suggesting that if you are able to provide a detailed map of enhancers affecting one tissue or another, we can probably this would be very much informative for us when we look at DNA methylation changes. I see. That's very helpful. I think I just leave the audience with the following idea that that increasingly the study of the human brain is giving more and more information about enhancers that regulate gene expression in the different types of neurons. And it may be that as they're defined more thoroughly, it would be very helpful to move back and forth, back and forth to the ancient samples to see um, how those enhancers might be mutated and methylated to give us a sense of gene regulation um, in greater detail. Anyway, I've been told that this was the last question, and I, I um, uh, want to thank you on behalf of the audience for a wonderful talk. Um, and. Uh, then um, there will be other questions that are in the in the chat that you can look at and um, perhaps answer. And now I'm um, to tell you that we are have about a 15 minute break. Is that right? Uh, we're going to shorten and just do a 10 minute break. We will okay. resume uh, at 10:25 as the agenda states. So we'll take a brief 10 minute break. Okay. So thanks very much to the audience and to the two speakers for our terrific talks. Okay, we're going to pause.
pull up some break slides while we're off camera. During the break, we are going to be advertising the upcoming Expanding Mind seminar series. As uh, many of you know, this event was meant to be a two-day in-person conference. Um, due to the virtual nature of events right now, we have split the two-day conference into a series. So we'll be um, going through the upcoming speaker series with the dates and the speakers.
Okay, everyone, welcome back. It is 25 past the hour. We are going to get started with the rest of our program. I am now going to introduce Dr. Christopher Walsh, director of the Allen Discovery Center for Human Brain Evolution, who will introduce our next speaker. Welcome, Chris. Great, good uh, morning and afternoon, uh, everyone. And I also wanna just thank uh, all of the people at the uh, Allen Frontiers Group for their support of our center and all of the people from the Allen Events staff who've uh, helped us organize things this afternoon. Uh, so our next speaker is going to be Alex Pollan. Uh, we'll now hear more about the uh, hardware of the brain and its evolution. Uh, Alex is a, presently an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. And uh, his lab looks at single cell genomics and genome engineering and great ape uh, organoids uh, to study specialized features of the developing brain. Uh, Alex graduated from Harvard College. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He then pursued his PhD in evolutionary genetics and neuroscience with David Kingsley at Stanford. And during his postdoc with uh, Arnold Kriegstein at UCSF, he uh, analyzed, he looked at molecular specializations of these specialized progenitor cells in the brain known as outer radial glial cells that he'll probably tell you more about. Uh, his talk today is entitled Establishing Great Ape Organoid Models uh, to Study Genomic Events Contributing to Human Brain Evolution, or maybe uh, he's changed the title slightly, but I'm sure you'll uh, enjoy uh, a fascinating talk from Alex. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Chris. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to participate in this symposium and to follow such excellent talks on genetic and epigenomic changes contributing to human evolution across different time scales and giving us access to these seemingly unknowable aspects of deep human history. Today, I'll be talking to you about genetic, developmental, and cellular approaches that we've been taking to look even deeper into human evolution at the divergence uh, between humans and our common ancestor with chimpanzee. Um, so dramatic changes in brain structure and function evolved along the lineage leading to humans. Our brains are over a thousand times larger than rodent brains and even in the last six million years, our brains have tripled in size and neuron number, but not all brain regions have increased in size equally. The neocortex, the folded region that occupies about 80% of the volume of our brain has expanded disproportionately compared with other regions. In addition to these changes in size, changes in cell type composition, connectivity, and the duration of plasticity and myelination together are thought to contribute to human cognitive specializations. In my lab, we're really interested in what is the genetic and developmental basis for these specializations. And today I'll talk to you about two projects, one focused on the evolution of cortical neuron number in recent human evolution, and one focused on changes in neuron composition in primates. When I started graduate school, it was this really exciting time when the chimpanzee genome had just been sequenced. And it seemed like we now had this roadmap where we could try to draw a line between particular human specific mutations and evolved traits that they might help explain. The challenge was, as Sarah talked about earlier, accounting for nucleotide substitutions and structural variation, there's about 100 million base pairs of divergence between human and chimpanzee. And most of these mutations are likely to be neutral in effect size. This was immediately likened to a needle in the haystack problem. How do we dig through these millions of mutations and this 100 million base pairs of divergence to identify which mutations are likely to be functional. Now studies of evolution in natural populations where genetic crosses are possible suggest that there are mutations of medium and large effect size that contribute to variation in traits, particularly under adaptive selection, like we saw with the regulation of the lactase gene beautifully in Sarah's talk. So based on this premise, innovative studies using computational comparative genomics lined up mammalian genomes and tried to look for mutations particularly likely to be functional. And these include human accelerated regions um, that have an excess of <coughs> nucleotide substitutions and otherwise well-conserved um, regions of the genome across mammals. In addition, duplication of coding genes is particularly likely to have functional consequences. And there's a number of duplicated coding genes with expression and interesting functions in developing brain. 
As a graduate student, I was fortunate to work in David Kingsley's lab on a collaboration with Gil Bejarano on another class of structural variation, deletions. In this case, we focused on deletions that removed otherwise well-conserved regions of the genome that we thought might act as regulatory enhancers that you heard earlier about. And I just wanna give a couple of quick examples to illustrate not only the promise of this approach, but some of the challenges of using solely a genome sequence-based approach. Um, so as a grad student, I was able to identify one example of a human mutation that moved a brain-specific regulatory enhancer conserved in other mammals. The ancestral-like allele of this enhancer drove expression in regions of the ventral forebrain that generated inhibitory neurons. And the enhancer was near a gene called GAD45G that normally represses proliferation and promotes differentiation. So we speculated that loss of this enhancer might release a break contributing to expansion of these populations. However, there's many other enhancers for GAD45G or at least regulatory elements that are accessible at these stages of development. And what we'd really like to know to study this further is whether the gene GAD45G had actually changed in expression in brain development between human and chimpanzee cells, whether the pathway had changed its activation and whether there were actual changes in progenitor cell behavior. In addition, many of the other regulatory elements that we found to have been deleted specifically in humans compared with other species had regulatory activity in entirely different tissues that had also been modified in evolution. So it was hard from sequence alone to predict which of these mutations might affect key brain cell types um, that influence brain specializations. And for me, that really crystallized, and this was the conclusion of my PhD thesis, that we needed a model system where we could identify actual differences between human and chimpanzee brain cells of uh, the types we thought underlie specializations of the brain. And if we're interested in the number of neurons in the cerebral cortex, development is really the time to look. At birth, the human brain is already twice as large as the chimpanzee brain, and nearly all the neurons of the cortex have already been generated. Therefore, it's long been thought that selection acted on patterns of proliferation prenatally during neurogenesis to influence brain size. If we take a closer look at the cells that generate the neurons of the cortex, they are these radial glia neural stem cells that line the ventricle of the developing brain. And a classic model in the field suggests that a simple expansion of the number of founder radial glia cells could increase the overall size of the brain and account for the tangential expansion of the cortical sheet observed across um, large brain mammals. Um, more recently, a histologically distinct compartment, the outer subventricular zone, was identified to be especially prominent in primates and humans. And this zone also contains a subtype of radial glia called outer radial glia neural stem cells that especially during upper layer corticogenesis may account for the majority of cortical neurons produced. However, what we'd like to do is compare human, chimpanzee, and other ape radial glia side by side and identify which gene expression programs, molecular pathways, and cell behaviors actually differ to explain these human specializations but grade eight brain development is inaccessible for ethical reasons to experimental and even comparative studies. So I concluded that maybe we would need a new model system. And at the time there were really exciting innovations using pluripotent stem cells to study human disease. This is a colony of pluripotent stem cells. And if exposed to the right patterning factors, this could be differentiated in principle into nearly any cell type in the body. So, if, if possible, this could enable isolation of the actual molecular and cellular changes that underlie species differences in the key cell types that we're interested in. When I started my postdoc in Arnold Kriegstein's lab, I was fortunate to see a talk from Yoshiki Sasai about how these stem cells, when cultured in suspension and exposed to very limited patterning, not only generate cell types of the developing retina or cortex, but they also generate a tissue organization reminiscent of very early brain development. And I thought this could be an excellent model to try a comparative evolution approach in a dish. And so the first question I had was, do these organoids recapitulate the key progenitor cell types predicted to underlie evolutionary changes in cortical neuron number? The Krigstein lab and the Huettner lab had recently discovered this population of radial glia that differed based on position, morphology, and behavior. And with Tom Nowakowski, we were able to employ single cell RNA sequencing to identify molecular markers that further distinguish this population. 
And so we asked, do these cells appear in organoids? And we found, indeed, we could see ventricular radioglia-like cells along these rosette structures of organoids. And away from the ventricle, we could see radioglia that expressed markers of outer radioglia and also showed this characteristic cell behavior that distinguishes the cell types. Um, with this in mind, I was enthusiastic to generate chimpanzee pluripotent stem cells, and I ordered fibroblasts from the Coriel cell repository and was able to reprogram these into pluripotent stem cells. I also linked up with Brian Pavlovich, then a graduate student in Yov Galad's lab, who generated a large and now widely used panel of these stem cells. And together, we were able to put together 18 stem cell lines to compare human and chimpanzee organoids. Um, after about seven to eight weeks, both the human and the chimpanzee organoids developed these elongated ventricular zone-like structures with cells that expressed the markers of radioglia and neural stem cells. And by 15 weeks, we could also see the production of distinct cortical excitatory neuron subtypes as labeled by different marker genes or proteins. So we asked, do organoids recapitulate evolved gene expression differences? And one of the challenges in working with complex tissue and particularly organoids is that there's composition differences from one run to run. And to account for these, we used single cell RNA sequencing where we isolated individual cells separately. And then we grouped these cells based on their similarity here colored by chimpanzee cells and human cells. And across about 60 organoids, we identified a very similar composition of cell types in aggregate. And we were able to compare cells of the same type and identify about 700 differentially expressed genes. About half of these we'd expect to be de derived along the human lineage. And the other half we'd expect to change in the chimp lineage. And we asked how well do these overlap with scarce human and macaque tissue sample comparisons that we could do. So using a very similar experiment, we found about a third of these organoid differentially expressed genes were recapitulated in the primary tissue analysis. Um, if I plot the primary cell genes on the x-axis and the organoid genes on the y-axis, we can see these were also correlated in full change and direction. But did we need to make organoids? Were these maybe concerted differentially expressed genes that we could have found using the fibroblasts themselves or the pluripotent stem cells? Turned out about 85% of the differential expression was organoid specific. And we consider this proof of principle for applying these organoid models to comparative studies of the evolution of development, particularly in species where the actual tissue is inaccessible. Um, so can we go and link this back to the actual genetic changes that accumulated in the human lineage? Can this data help us filter for needles in the haystack? We looked for what types of mutations might be enriched among these differentially expressed genes. And the class that stood out might not be surprising. If a gene is duplicated, there's more copies in human than in chimpanzee. And in aggregate, you'd expect greater expression. I'm highlighting one example of a pair of genes, Notch2NL and NBPF, that were duplicated multiple times in the human lineage. What we could really add to this discussion is that these genes are specifically expressed in radioglia neural stem cells themselves. And in the case of these two genes that duplicated in tandem, we could also see that their expression was highly correlated across single cells, suggesting that they may carry coordinated regulation for this cell type. We also found another interesting enrichment that had been proposed previously, and that was duplications that occurred prior to the human chimpanzee split, where we both carry additional copies, were also enriched for human specific expression changes suggesting that these may be a substrate for the accumulation of additional regulatory changes. And here's one example of a monoamine transporter duplicated in humans and chimpanzee, where we only see a gain of expression in humans. Coming back to deletions, we didn't see an overall enrichment, but in collaboration with Evan Eichler's lab and Jason Underwood, we're able to identify some intriguing examples. In this case, the gene CDC25C, an important regulator of mitosis, is specifically missing an exon in humans that's conserved across other primates. When we look closer at our single cell data, we can see that in the developing brain, this is specifically expressed during mitosis. And further, when we look at our organoid data, we can see that the exon that's missing in humans appears to be constitutively expressed in chimpanzee radial glia. And so that suggests to us that or indicates that this human mutation changes the isoform of CDC25C that's used in dividing radioglia neural stem cells. 
Um, we also found a coherence of differentially expressed genes in the mTOR pathway. This is a pathway that regulates many cellular properties, including metabolism, growth, and stem cell renewal. And Tom Nowakowski, who I worked closely with, had recently observed that although this pathway is typically associated with neurons, at these developmental stages, we saw specific activation as denoted by immunostaining for phosphorylation of the effector gene S6 in radial glia neural stem cells, particularly outer radial glia. And we asked based on this differential expression whether this had changed between primates. And indeed, we found a threefold increase in the proportion of human outer radial glia with activated mTOR signaling compared with other species, with macaque and also with chimp organoids. We could confirm this by Western blot, primary human versus primary macaque, as well as human organoid versus chimp organoid for PS6 and other effectors, effectors as well as insulin receptor and other upstream candidates that we had seen in our data were upregulated in humans. And indeed, if we try to knock down the expression of these upregulated genes in human developing brain tissue, we can see that indeed they're necessary, both insulin receptor and integrin beta-8 for the activation of this pathway. And that's consistent with earlier suggestions from the Hutner lab that integrin signaling may be important for radioglia. So to conclude this section, um, we're really enthusiastic about the opportunity to complement computational comparative genomics approaches with comparative studies of stem cell derived organoids across the primate phylogeny. And today I talked to you about how we looked at gene expression and we're able to identify brains, developing brain specific derived gene expression changes, link these back to intriguing candidate mutations and identify candidate pathways influencing key cell types. I also want to take the time to highlight other innovative studies in the field, including the Prescott study from the Wysoka lab here that termed the field cellular anthropology. And I think that really reflects the discussion today, how we can use these new techniques to look back into these progressively deeper windows of human evolution and human history. And these studies, as well as ongoing work in our lab, are also extending not just from gene expression, but to other phenotypes from chromatin accessibility all the way to cell behavior and physiology. And we're also really enthusiastic about the prospect of incorporating genome engineering in these models that we can now test the necessity and sufficiency of human specific mutations in the endogenous loci and appropriate genetic and cellular context where they occurred. Um, we focused mostly on radial glia and partly that's because these are thought to contribute to the expansion of this conspicuous trait of cortical neuron number, but also because organoids already produce radial glia with reasonably high fidelity across the multiple subtypes. But other human traits that might be particularly important for cognition, changes in the proportion of upper layer neurons, changes in the composition or migration of inhibitory neurons, or changes in connectivity and physiology may require future innovations in organoid models. And because of the biomedical relevance of these models, there's a huge investment in these improvements. And I'm fortunate to be part of a collaboration with the Brain Engineers team at UC Santa Cruz, led by David Hausler, where we're trying to go from individual lab protocols to really scaling the generation of these organoid models, improving their fidelity to primary tissue cell types and developmental processes, and in particular, incorporating longitudinal sensing and monitoring of phenotypes to, in a more unbiased way, measure um, how gene genotype interacts with phenotype. And finally, I want to come back to how these stem cells are really an opportunity to map traits all along the phylogeny. We focused mostly on human and chimpanzee divergence so far, but we could extend further into the phylogeny to identify when in ape evolution different traits evolved, as well as developmental changes contributing to specializations in other species. And we talked before about the limited genetic diversity in humans. Um, humans went through this bottleneck, but there's a wealth of genetic, naturally occurring genetic diversity in these other species that we could take advantage of to improve our genotype phenotype relationships. And so Brian, who I mentioned before, is now a postdoc in my lab, and he's working on extending our panel to all the species listed here. Um, in the second part of my talk, and a bit um, more briefly, I want to talk about a complementary approach for the systematic analysis of cell type evolution. And so I want to come back to this question of what's special about the human brain. And I talked about this disproportionate expansion of the cortex. 
And we usually think about that in terms of how more cortical neurons might endow us with increased cognitive capacities. But there's a flip side to that, and that cell types in other brain regions that interact with the enlarged cortex may now have to adapt to this enlarged and potentially a harsh large brain cortex, large cortex environment. And one class in particular is inhibitory neurons that are generated in ventral regions of the forebrain and migrate long distances into the cortex, to regions of the basal forebrain, and to the olfactory bulb. And it's documented that large brain mammals have an increased proportion of these inhibitory neurons in cortex, including in the white matter, where there's also been changes in the distribution of inhibitory neurons expressing tyrosine hydroxylase, the rate limiting enzyme for the production of dopamine and other catecholamines. And there's also changes in these TH cells and even primate specific inhibitory neuron subtypes in the striatum. So we wondered, are these inhibitory neuron precursors conserved between primates and rodents, particularly at these stages of development when in the primate brain, they have to migrate long distances and adapt to this large cortex environment. And I want to highlight here, this work was done by my first graduate student, Matthew Schmitz, who really shaped the project. Um, with Matthew, we dissected uh, tissue from regions that produce the inhibitory neurons, as well as migratory destinations across the cortex and subcortical regions throughout the span of inhibitory neuron production in rhesus macaque. And Here's a plot of about 100,000 inhibitory neurons grouped based on their transcriptional similarity, but colored based on where they were dissected from. We can see most of the cells dissected from the progenitor zones are here, cells from cortex fall here, striatum, preoptic area, and septum here. And we can also color these cells based on their transcriptional similarity and their discrete clusters. And we find about 11 discrete clusters here that correspond to diverse subtypes that are further specified across the forebrain. And so how well are these conserved between mouse and macaque? If we line up each of these cell types side by side and look at how well they're correlated across highly variable genes, we can see that in general, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between rhesus inhibitory neuron precursors and mouse, for example, direct and indirect medium spiny neurons. However, I wanna highlight a few examples of interesting homologies that we don't think are due to sampling. And the first case here, we see these two macaque striatal interneuron cell types correspond to a single mouse type. When we take a closer look at this cluster, this actually corresponds to a recent discovery from phenacrenin in the McCarroll lab that primates have evolved a uh, TAC3 specific striatal interneuron cell type not found in rodents or carnivores. And I won't talk about this more except to say that by isolating the developmental stages where this is specified, we could potentially get into the mechanisms for how you create evolutionarily novel cell types. And I want to advertise that Fana will be talking more about her comparative study later on in this symposium um, series in March. And Today, for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on another interesting case of homology. These two classes that we think are generated in the lateral ganglionic eminence, the LGE, and particularly this one in purple that I call MICE2 PAC6, that correlates most strongly with olfactory bulb granule cells in the mouse rather than cells in the telencephalon. We became interested in this cell type because most neurons in the cortex, most of the inhibitory neurons are generated in the CGE and MGE and not the LGE. And most of them are roughly evenly distributed across cortical areas. But these mysterious LGE-derived populations had an anterior to posterior gradient at these stages. They were enriched in prefrontal cortex. And transcriptionally, we thought they might correspond to this white matter interstitial cell, at least uh, to different subtypes of it potentially. And so we wondered, where did these cells originate? And to get at that question, we could reconstruct the gene expression trajectories from progenitors to these different cell types and look for transcription factors and other genes that might mark their origin. And to summarize Matthew's work, he found that they seem to match most closely with this region of the LGE highlighted here. And we believe that because they have limited expression for markers of the caudal ganglionic eminence, they show expression for markers of the dorsal lateral ganglionic eminence. And this is a plot here. The size of the circle represents the percentage of cells that express the gene and the color represents the intensity. And I also wanna highlight that at these developmental stages, these were the only cells that expressed tyrosine hydroxylase that I mentioned earlier. 
And although these dots are really small, it was only a minority of the cells, I want to come back to this expression at later developmental stages where we think a distinct subtype emerges. And finally, these cells expressed many of the markers of LGE origin, but they did not express FOXP1, the marker of the canonical marker for medium spiny neurons that the LGE produces. So we think the birthplace is in this region typically called the dorsal LGE, but at the interior portion. And we've been calling it the external LGE or XLGE because at the interior portion, it actually wraps around ventral to the rest of the ganglionic eminences and throughout it contacts the external capsule here. If we take a closer look at a sagittal section of a developing macaque brain, we can see that the co-expression pattern of these genes here, secretagogin in PAC6, extends continuously from the anterior LGE all the way through to the olfactory bulb, to olfactory bulb granule cells, consistent with the homology that we found. In addition to that ancestral migratory pathway, if we take a coronal section right here, we can see these really dense parenchymal chains of cells expressing the same markers. It looks like these precursors bound for olfactory bulb are radiating into deep white matter of the prefrontal cortex. And this builds from work in Arturo Everest Bullia's lab. So what about later in development? Um, here, this is 40 days later and three weeks after cortical neurogenesis has concluded. The olfactory bulb granule cells account for the majority of adult neurogenesis in the olfactory bulb in, in rodents. So we expected they might still be express, act, uh, migrating here. And indeed, we could see this rostral migratory stream um, continuing at these late stages. But we also saw another dorsomedial stream moving towards cingulate cortex that appeared to be bounded by TH fibers from the midbrain and was always internal to these. If we take a horizontal section of that same slice, we can see that these cells move caudally and medially towards the cingulate cortex. Um, what about at even later stages? At seven months postnatal, we still see this rostral migratory stream emanating from the anterior XLGE. But we also started to see cells that expressed tyrosine hydroxylase, that rare marker that we observed earlier in development. We could see these cells in olfactory structures, here the ventral olfactory nucleus, and also in the periglomerular layer of the olfactory bulb. But Matthew looked very carefully across these sections, and he found these rare cell types that are triple positive for these markers in the claustrum, extending processes towards striatum and possibly towards cortex. And when he looked at the striatum, he found that these cells appear to line up along the boundary of the striatum and they arrive at E120, but only later do they extend these processes. Um, when we look in rodents, we never see these cells in the striatum or cortex. We only see them as periglomerular cells in the olfactory bulb or in the olfactory peduncle. And that suggests these cells are primate specific. So to conclude, by single cell RNA-seq, we found these two interesting primate populations. These deep white matter neurons have a qualitatively distinct migratory pathway in primates, and also these peristriatal cells. And based on the continuity of gene expression and their migration paths, we think they have a one-to-one -one and direct developmental correspondence with olfactory ball granule cells and TH periglomerular cells. So we're calling this population TH peristriatal cells. And our model is that there's these ancestrally conserved migratory pathways to different parts of the olfactory bulb that in primates and perhaps other large brain mammals um, have also been reared distributed to deep white matter and to near the striatum. And why might these olfactory bulb neurons be redistributed in the primate brain? Well, here's a picture of a mouse brain. You can see how large the olfactory bulb is relative to the rest of the brain. I talked about the disproportionate expansion of cortex, but the olfactory bulb has been disproportionately reduced. And my student calls this the reduce and reuse model, that the reduction of the olfactory bulb might have made these progenitor cells and precursors available to supply neurons to other regions of the brain. And so why the white matter? We talked about the expansion of neuron number in the gray matter of cortex as a key human trait, but the white matter, which mostly contains axons, has expanded super linearly compared with the gray matter. And it's thought that a sub, and although neurons are sparse there, there's millions of neurons in the white matter. And it's thought that a subset of these may contribute to interaerial connectivity. Um, in this case, we find it really interesting that cells, the latest born neurons that support plasticity in the adult olfactory bulb seem to show a redistributed migratory pathway to the white matter 
that's among the latest maturing parts of our brains, taking 20 years, over 20 years to completely myelinate in the frontal lobe. And so to conclude the talk, I've discussed how we can use these stem cell and organoid models to identify candidate mutations and candidate pathways that occur recently in human evolution after our divergence from chimpanzee. And I've talked about how we can use comparative evolutionary single cell genomics to identify primate specific cell types and migratory pathways. And I think these are some examples of a more general framework of extending from comparative genomics to functional analysis and stem cell and organoid models. And um, I'll stop here for questions. And, and of course, um, to acknowledge this uh, yeah, excellent group of collaborators I've been so fortunate to work with, Aparna Baduri and Tom Nowakowski on the organoids, uh, more recently, um, David Hausler and Sophie Salama on the Brain Engineers Project, and especially thank my former mentors, Arnold Krigstein and David Kingsley. And the second half of the talk was really driven by my grad student, Matthew Schmitz, who has an eye for bioinformatic and histological patterns and grateful to have a lab working on such exciting questions. So thank you. Great, thanks very much, Alex. That was really beautiful. Uh, I just wanna let people know you can put your questions in the Q&A and uh, while they're collecting, there's already one or two, um, maybe I'll just ask you a question or two of my own. Uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, these deep white matter and peristriatal cells are really fascinating. Uh, I, if I understood correctly, those are inhibitory neurons? Is that yes, right? that's right. These and, appear to be inhibitory neurons based on their gene expression patterns. And at early developmental stages, they seem to be identical or near homologous to these olfactory bulb cells. But mm -hmm. the inhibitory neurons tend to further differentiate based on their regional destination. Yeah, so then um, it looks like they have very complex origin. Uh, do they divide? You know, there was a report many years ago by Pashko Rakesh's group of a, of a ventral, of a dorsal origin of inhibitory neurons. Could this go anywhere to resolving that sort of source of confusion? Could these be, are, are they progenitors that are dividing while they're migrating or are they post mitotic neurons? Uh, do you know? Yeah, there's this um, idea that given the expansion of the cortex and the increased proportion of inhibitory neurons, there may be locally produced inhibitory neurons at later stages of development in the cortex directly. And at least these classes, we're looking at post mitotic precursors. We do see some cell division in the external LGE, but once you get out along the migratory streams, we don't see so much, but I'll, I'll leave that open to further studies. It could be that these progenitor cells or this expression pattern does shift dorsally at much later timescales. Uh, and, um, and so uh, you were saying that you know, to a certain extent, the growth of the white matter uh, in humans or in precursors of humans may have enabled these cells to take a different path than they do uh, in non-human primates or other animals and invade the white matter, invade the dorsal white matter. Do you think that it would be just anatomical or do you think that there might be molecular changes in the guidance cues that those cells recognize that might be, you know, evolutionarily dynamic to have also enabled this sort of change in their migratory path? And if so, do you have any candidate genes in mind? Yeah, so the question is, could these changes simply be explained by developmental constraints? It's a really long distance. Maybe it's harder to get there in the primate brain and they get stuck, or their destination is full, so they go somewhere else, or are there functional constraints that um, invoked mosaic evolution and changed migratory cues? And I don't have much evidence one way or the other. I favor the um, functional constraints model. These cells are capable of migrating extremely long distances and they have a longer time to migrate in the primate brain. We've certainly looked at axon and uh, migratory guidance molecules and uh, we have some ideas about it, but we don't have any strong candidates yet. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a question in the Q&A uh, from uh, Mariam Orkodashvili. Pardon me if I butchered pronunciation of your name, Mariam. Uh, for Alex Pollan, how could FOXP2 gene be associated with language capacity and or language area damage uh, in the brain? Yeah, so FOXP2 is one of these famous examples of a gene that accumulated a few surprising coding mutations in human evolution. And um, there are a number of families where there are kind of rare de novo mutations of FOXP2 that cause speech and language deficits. 
So for a long time, it's been a really interesting and compelling gene that you know maybe the amino acid substitutions contribute to human evolution. There's also really interesting potential non-coding variation um, if you compare FOXP2 haplotypes. Um, and in the brain, you know, FOXP2 is widely expressed across a diversity of inhibitory neuron, um, excitatory neuron cell types. So it's hard to say that the FOXP2 in these cells in particular, I think that's one of the challenges more generally with looking at protein coding mutations. These genes are so widely expressed, it's hard to know where the amino acid substitutions might have an impact, if anywhere. And that's one of the exciting prospects if we can identify regulatory changes, maybe from the ancient DNA epigenomics or from genetic mapping or from these stem cell studies, that regulatory enhancers might really point us to the cell types, developmental stages and circuits where the evolutionary change was manifest. And that's one of the inspirations for us to actually make these cell types from humans and chimps where we could try to isolate the most conspicuous differences in chromatin accessibility in a more unbiased way. Great. Uh, here's another interesting question from Julio Martinez Trujillo. Uh, it was not clear whether the olfactory bulb neurons migrate to areas uh, that have expanded the most in humans, the prefrontal cortex, or what about the posterior parietal lobe? Could you comment on that? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, where do these neurons go? It, it's hard to fully trace the migratory pathways. It seems that these really late born LGE derived neurons Primar primarily go dorsally and medially and then caudally um, towards cingulate cortex, both anterior and posterior, and possibly, as the question asked, all the way towards the occipital lobe. At the early developmental stages we looked by single cell, they were mainly in frontal cortex, but I think they do move further occipital. Interestingly, we don't really see them in the white matter lateral to the striatum, there we see more CGE-derived inhibitory neurons. Uh, another question um, from um, D. Chander from Stanford. Uh, the claustrum is one of the few places that seems to form widespread projections throughout cortex from a very small region and could coordinate conscious processing. Any thoughts about this? Uh, at one point, I had considered modulating the claustrum optogenetically to study consciousness state switches. It's um, a little out, out of your area, but I'd love to- I'm out of my depth here, but it's true. Um, you know, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch have, have long speculated that the claustrum, because it receives input from so many cortical areas and projects to almost everywhere in the cortex, that this might be a brain region that can bind together information from different modalities and kind of unify these representations or bind them. And actually, I was looking back at um, one of Francis Crick's old papers, and he speculated that you know, maybe there would be some new or rare inhibitory neuron cell types in the classroom that could propagate connections between parts of the classroom in a similar way to periglomerular cells of the olfactory bulb. And I don't know that these cells, when they get to the classroom, form those connections or other properties, but it was a you know, very interesting uh, connection to some of the early or ideas about the classroom. Um, but again, we're, you know, very limited in, in making functional implications from this early developmental data to the actual circuits. Now here's a cool uh, question from Gene E. Robinson, who asks, does the brain engineering approach aspirationally consider the possibility of creating Neanderthal or Denisovan organisms? Yeah, that's a great question. I, one of the, you know, things that's so exciting about studying the functional consequences of Neanderthal sequence variation is that so much of this variation still segregates among modern humans. Mm -hmm. And in principle, you know, bringing human genetics to the dish, which many groups are doing now with thousands of human pluripotent stem cells, in aggregate will carry, you know, maybe 20 to 40% of admixed variants from Neanderthals. So I think it's certainly possible. I think that genome-wide association mapping itself in actual humans might get at even more crisp, uh, phenotypic consequences of these admixed variants. I think many of them are likely to be deleterious due to the small population sizes um, that may have permitted these deleterious variants to um, go to high frequency. I think the most interesting variants would be in these kind of de admixture deserts where we have no introgress Neanderthal variation. And you know, those would be very hard to generate since we don't have them in human cells and they cover large spans. And that's where we think these chimpanzee pluripotent stem cells could serve as a proxy for at least some of the features. 
and then genome engineering could fill in the gap. Uh, the next question is from um, our colleague and friend Zoltan Molnar. Zoltan, thanks for listening. He's got a great question. Uh, there are some huge changes in the tangential migration of glutamatergic neurons between sauropsids and mammals at very early stages of forebrain development. Uh, any strong glutamatergic tangentially migrating populations in human at early or at later stages? Um, yeah, Zoltan has, has done some beautiful work on the dorsal ventricular ridge, this part of the lateral pallium that has expanded so much in, uh, in birds and accounts for the majority of paleo structures in birds and has some similar connections. And our initial study focused mainly on inhibitory neurons, but I think it's a great idea to consider these long migrating, ten tangentially migrating glutamatergic neurons from the lateral pallium that go to amygdala and other regions that may also have faced similar pressures to exist in a kind of large, just unequal scaled uh, primate and human brain. And that's a great idea for another place to look is, as we look more deeply at this data set. I mean, those cells almost migrate from just dorsal to this region of the LGE that we're talking about. So it would be a natural next place to look. Um, another uh, interesting question from Gene Robinson. Uh, regarding the current state of the art in the field, what's the oldest uh, brain organoid? And is it possible to make organoids that are adult-like? That's a great question. There's a number of groups that have kept organoids alive for several years. You know, we, we've, alive is a strong word, kept organoids in culture. You know, these are kind of clusters of cells that group together that are only a few million cells. They don't possess cognition or other brain-like properties, but have kept these in culture for a year or two. We've kept human, chimp, and orangutan organoids in culture for over a year. But I think they hit some roadblocks. You know, there's publications that they, you know, so in our data, they switch from neurogenesis to gliogenesis, but they also encounter a lot of metabolic stress and other challenges. And there's things that maybe limit the physiological activity. When we did our comparison side by side with primary cell tissue, we saw that the gene co-expression logic was largely preserved in organoid models, but there's really elevated metabolic stress, glycolysis, and ER stress. And we think we need to solve these problems. And that's one of the you know, inspirations for the brain engineers team and many other groups to try to vascularize these organoids or perfuse them to uh, reduce the metabolic stress, to keep them in culture and to link them with sensors. And, you know, it's a hope that we could model circuits in a more reductionist way using the organoids and including chimeric circuits between species and other, you know, exciting possibilities you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, I guess this is the last question and it's from Kathy Murphy. Um, and have you seen any uh, specialized white matter cells? She's, uh, I'm thinking about the unique myelination patterns and the super, superficial layers of the sensory cortices of humans. Yeah, we are really interested in looking more deeply at the superficial and deep white matter. In our data at these early stages, we see um, at least three different potential white matter neuron subtypes, two derived from the LGE, we think one is an interneuron and one is long projecting. And we also see cells derived from the CGE. But I think we'd really have to go to later stages um, to further characterize this diversity. And I think most of these cell atlases are focused on gray matter diversity right now. So that's a, a niche we're, we're interested in filling and following up on further. It's, it's a great question. And I think they may have real important functions related to um, human cortical development and cognition. Um, all right, so thank you. Really grateful to participate in the symposium and exciting discussion. Thanks for all the questions. Yeah, these are really great. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a beautiful talk. Uh, gorgeous pictures and really neat. A uh, lot, of, lot to think about. Uh, and I really want to thank everybody for all of the uh, great uh, questions and answers. And uh, sorry that we did not get to all of them. We'll try to have uh, Alex answer some of the other ones uh, in print as he's, uh, as he's able. Uh, but uh, we want to uh, leave time for our uh, last uh, speaker of the day. Uh, and uh, this is a real thrill and a pleasure to introduce uh, Patricia Churchland of UC San Diego, uh, who's gonna be our uh, last speaker. And so we've been sort of, uh, you know, we've tried to cover a wide range of aspects of human brain evolution. Uh, and we're really thrilled to uh, hear uh, Pat's thoughts on, um, on these higher level things. So for those 
who don't know her, Patricia Smith Churchin. She's Professor Emerita of Philosophy at the University of California, San Diego, and an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute. Uh, her research focuses on the interface between neuroscience and philosophy. Uh, she's the author of the pioneering book, Neurophilosophy, uh, in uh, 1986. And as someone who was just uh, finishing graduate school at that time, it's hard to underestimate what a transformational book that was. At that, back in those days, serious scientists like Karl Popper and John Eccles were still sort of talking about this you know, mind-brain interface in a way that was almost religious. Uh, and uh, Patricia's work really brought that uh, into the realm of neuroscience and established this whole field of neurophilosophy. Uh, soon after that was followed another book with Terry Sajanowski uh, called The Computational Brain. And her, uh, her current work actually focuses on morality in the social brain. Uh, she, in 2011, she published Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. Uh, and then uh, in 2013, she published Touching a Nerve, uh, published by Norton Press, which portrays how to get comfortable with this fact that I am what I am because my brain is what it is. Uh, her most recent book, published in 2019, uh, is entitled Conscious, Conscience, The Origins of Moral Intuition. Uh, and um, so she's been recognized by many, many different awards, including a MacArthur Genius Award for her work. Uh, her talk today is called The Neurobiological Platform for Moral Conscience. And I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and a remarkable end to what's been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Churchland. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me all right, yes? Good, okay, yeah, well. This has been a remarkable morning and I have to say I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's really a great thrill and I'm very honored um, to, <clears throat> to be able to give a talk um, at the Allen in particular, but uh, to this group. Uh, what I want to do today is, as the title suggests, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the foundation in neurobiological terms uh, for a moral conscience. This is a really large topic, of course, and so my aim will be to try to give a, a very broad picture, a kind of panoramic view um, of where we are. And I want to start, um, now let's see, this, my slides are not advancing. Try clicking, try clicking on the screen one more time. One more time, you got it, okay. No, it's not. I can advance for you. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. So in 1975, Ed Wilson said that he thought the evolution of human sociality is the fundamental conundrum of biology. And I think at that time, uh, many, many people, including me, uh, would have agreed with him. And what I think is kind of remarkable is that over the last 40 years, quite a lot of progress has been made in addressing that conundrum. Next slide. Now, biologists in general have realized that from an evolutionary perspective, an animal needs to be fundamentally selfish in the sense that it needs to have the wiring to take care of its own needs, its food, its warmth, its water, and its mating. If it doesn't care about those things, uh, then of course it doesn't live to pass on its genes. So in a certain sense, care of oneself is the deepest level of value. Next slide. Now, recognizing that, many evolutionary biologists such as Richard Dawkins considered how it is possible that humans might behave in an altruistic way. And here by altruism, I'm just going to mean something very simple, namely that you incur a cost to yourself in order to benefit others. I'm gonna shut the door, hang on. Sorry, I just realized there's, there's sound from out there. And so Dawkins in The Selfish Gene uh, echoed, I think, the view of many uh, people who had thought about morality. And that is that uh, you have to teach the whole thing to children. That is, you have to kind of ensure uh, that they learn about how to be moral agents. Otherwise, they will be completely selfish. 
next slide. Now, it's very interesting, actually, that Darwin had a different view. So in 1871, in The Descent of Man, Darwin asks the question, where does our moral sense or conscience come from? And he averred that there were really three components, that we have social instincts, that given those social instincts, we learn social skills and habits about how to effectively live in a social group. And finally, we have the capacity for problem solving with regard to certain kinds of social problems when the ecology changes, for example. Next slide. Now, this was not an entirely new view, um, but I think Darwin put it particularly well. But it was also the view of Aristotle, of Confucius, and of the two great Scots moral theorists, David Hume and Adam Smith. <clears throat> Next slide. Now, much has changed since Darwin raised those questions. And what is, I think, kind of especially interesting is that the range of sciences that have collaborated to address those questions and address them in terms of mechanism has been really important. Next slide. Now, what I will have most to talk about is uh, neuroendocrinology. But I think an enormous service was done by the ethologists, both those who studied animals in captivity and those who studied animals in the wild. Because it was very common at the time that Ed Wilson made his comment, 1975, for people, in particular for philosophers, to think that humans alone had any kind of moral impulses or any kind of moral behavior. And the ethologist showed us that, that was really quite wrong. And in 1996, for example, I think um, Franz de Waal published his book, Good Natured, which had an enormous effect by showing behavior after behavior that was suitable for chimpanzees, but nonetheless looked like consolation after a defeat, reconciliation after a squabble, pro-social choice, for example, sharing food, orphan adoption by non-biological fathers of orphans whose mothers had been killed. We see empathy, punishment, fairness, self-control, cooperation, and reasoning. And some labs even show that we see help of one animal by another, incurring a cost to itself in order to benefit another, in rats. So I think the ethologists really alerted us to the fact that sociality is not unique to humans, nor is morality, and that it is probably very deep. Next slide. Now this is of course rather outdated and rather old, but on the vertical axis you see years and millions, and on the horizontal axis you see geographical spread. The anthropologists and archaeologists, I think, were extremely important in broadening our understanding of the fact that Homo sapiens have been around for about 300,000 300, years. And for all but about 10,000 of those years, we lived together in small groups. And almost certainly so did Homo erectus, who was around for about 1.8 million years. To live together in small groups is a kind of sociality and that the sociality we see now where we might, for example, have specific contracts about land ownership or laws about organ donation. Those were not the kinds of conventions and rules that were needed or thought about by groups of Homo erectus or Homo sapiens in ancient times. Next slide. <clears throat> now, sociality is seen in many species across taxa. For example, there are discus fish, uh, there are termites and bees, but it does seem quite obvious that the sociality that we see in, in uh, mammals is really quite different. 
it's quite different both in its flexibility, uh, meaning that it is not quite so tightly tied uh, to the genes, but in the fact that so much is learned on the part of mammals and birds. Next slide. So the hypothesis to sort of um, get into this story goes like this, that about 200 million years ago, warm-blooded animals, very small, appeared on the planet. And this was a tremendous advantage because the animals could forage at night when the cold-blooded animals were lying around waiting for the sun to come up. So they could also forage and make a life in colder climates. However, endothermy came with a huge cost. Gram for gram, the warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much as the cold-blooded animal. So this is a huge ecological pressure or constraint. Next slide. And one way to address that constraint is to be smart. And to be smart in a very specific way, that is to be able to learn about your physical and your wider causal, perhaps social environment. And so with mammals in particular, we see the emergence of this amazing structure called cortex. In, in reptiles, we don't see anything that is even roughly comparable. There's this sort of thing called a dorsal cortex, which is at maybe three layers if you're generous. Um, but cortex as we see it in all mammals is highly structured, at least six layers, depending on how you prefer to count. Um, and cortex appears to be the thing that allows mammals to be such tremendous, um, to give mammals such tremendous flexibility. And the side here about birds, we now know, which we didn't until fairly recently, that birds do have in their brains the, the wiring which gives functional equivalence to cortex in mammals. It's just that it's organized slightly differently, so to the eye, it doesn't look like cortex. But in any case, to keep things simple, I'm going to just talk about mammals. Now, cortex is a great thing, and if you're going to learn, and that seems to be the point of cortex, then you have to build structure. You have to make uh, the dendritic tree sprout here and there, or the axonal branches sprout here and there. You have to get new um, receptors. You ha maybe have to make new contacts. Next slide. And what that means then is that in the newborn, cortex looks uh, very undeveloped. Most of the neurons that the animal is ever going to have, most, are there, but they don't have much in the way of arborization in the dendrites or in the axons. Um, roughly at two years of age, we can see that a huge amount has been learned. The structure reflects the fact that there has been tremendous learning on the part of uh, the child. And at two years, there's also a kind of pruning back as there is in adolescence. Next slide. Now, in order to be able to have all that structure built to reflect your physical and social world, um, you have to be born pretty immature. And that seems okay. Uh, and here are neonate rats. As you can see, they're blind, they're hairless. There's not much they can do except scrabble about and maybe find something warm and suck on it. Now, the downside or the cost is that if you're going to be born immature so you can later be smart, is that you better have somebody take care of you. And the mum is the one who's around and the mum is the one initially uh, who takes care of the offspring. Next slide. So basically what we see is that as a result of the evolution of warm bloodedness, learning capacity goes up, but neonatal independence goes down. Next slide. So now the question is for mother nature, how are you going to deal with the fact that the infants are born so immature? 
how are you going to ensure that the mother takes care of them? After all, a mother turtle doesn't, a mother lizard doesn't. How are you going to make that happen? Functionally speaking, or at least at a conceptual level, basically what you do is you expand the ambit of myself so that just as I take care of my own food and warmth and safety, so I take care of the food and warmth and safety of the offspring. But mechanistically, how does that happen? Next slide. Now, there are many components to this story, but again, for the purposes of simplicity, I'm going to focus on oxytocin because it does actually have a very important role. Oxytocin, as you know, is a very ancient molecule, nine amino acids. It has a sibling peptide, vasopressin, which differs in only two places uh, of amino acids. It is important in the contractions of the uterus to get the baby born. It is also essential for uh, milk ejection. So there is, of course, something that changes in the mother of the brain, and this had to be an evolutionary adaptation. And the change is that the mother has the wiring now so that the baby becomes part of herself. She is very strongly bonded to the baby. And when she holds the baby skin to skin, there is a rush of oxytocin in her brain, but there's also oxytocin rush in the baby's brain. And the two become very, very tightly bonded. Next slide. Now, this was known, of course, for some time, but the story and how it might actually generalize to other aspects of mammalian sociality didn't really occur to people. And sometimes I think it was because it was a story about huh, mothers and babies. I mean, how can that be interesting? But it turned out, of course, to be the critical part of the story. In this slide, I just am reminding us that uh, oxytocin in the brain is released in two nuclei of the hypothalamus. Uh, those nuclei also allow for release uh, into the body. And this shows just a little bit of the projection pattern, but we're gonna come back to this again. Next slide. Now, everything changed for me and the story of oxytocin when Larry Young came to the Salk and talked about prairie voles. And initially I thought, oh, how, how can this be very interesting? And he started off and he said, well, there's montane voles and they live in the mountains and they nest under rocks and montane voles are kind of like what you think about rodents in general, that the male and the female meet, they mate, and then they go their separate ways. He's looking for more action and she's gonna have the babies. Next slide. But then he talked about the prairie voles and they meet and they mate and now they're bonded for life. The male helps take care of the babies when the mom goes off and forages. He huddles over them, he protects them, he guards the nest against intruders. They also like to hang out together. And if they are separated, they become depressed. And if they're put back together in the same cage, they become quite joyous and lick each other and so forth. So the question then that Larry Young asked, and there were others who were working on the same problem like Sue Carter, who said, the question is, what's the difference in the brain? I mean, these are both voles. Next slide. And as, as you will all know, of course, the story turned out to depend on the distribution and density of receptors for oxytocin, but vasopressin was an important part of the story as well. And in the top row, what you can see are slices of brain and the montane vole and the prairie vole, and the gray shows the staining for oxytocin receptors. And in the nucleus accumbens, you can see in the prairie vole, there's a high density of receptors for oxytocin. The Young Lab then, of course, went on to do the various manipulations that showed not merely is there a correlation here between long-term pair bonding and density of receptors, but there are causal connections as well. Next slide. <clears throat> so 
as I was sitting in the audience, I was really quite stunned because I had thought, you know, that we could make a lot of progress in understanding the nature of perception and decision making. I even thought, and still do, that we can make quite a lot of progress in understanding consciousness. But I really didn't think that it would be any time soon that we would understand where our moral instincts, our social instincts came from. The other thing in the Prairie Vole story that of course was really important is that uh, there are links between um, the reward system and oxytocin. And in particular, there are lots and lots of oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens, which is an important part of the reward system, along with the ventral tegmental area and many other areas besides. Next slide. So this uh, just shows you the paraventricular nucleus of the thalamus and that it, where it projects to. And there is the VTA, there is the nucleus accumbens, also to the hippocampus. And it turns out that in the CA2 region of, enter, of the hippocampus, uh, there is a significant density of receptors for oxytocin. This, of course, is a schematic rat brain, and you can see that there are projections, projections also to the olfactory bulb, which you would expect. Next slide. This um, just shows these funny little Y thingies are um, representing areas where you find a uh, oxytocin receptors. And you can see that even in the rat brain, there are lots and lots of oxytocin receptors. And you can see the paraventricular nucleus again and the super optic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And there are many, many regions um, to which they project. Next slide. So of course, the entry point to this story in thinking about morality is that it was the prairie voles, but we know that only about 8% of mammals are long-term pair bonders. Beavers, titi monkeys, capuchin monkeys, certainly marmosets and so forth. But many mammals do live in social groups, but they don't necessarily have long-term pair bonding. So for example, in baboons, the strongest bonds are between the mother and her daughters and her daughters and her daughters and so forth. So depending on the distribution of oxytocin, which is going to be affected by the ecology in which the animal lives, uh, you may see strong connections between me and kin or me, kin and kith, the old Scots word, um, for friend. Next slide. So oxytocin was called by some people a love molecule, which is really a, a sort of one of those unfortunate things. I shouldn't even repeat the unfortunate thing because then people remember it. Um, but oxytocin does a lot of things. And one of the things that it does is it tends to decrease uh, cortisol levels so that as oxytocin levels go up, cortisol levels go down. Now that's just to a first approximation, the story this being biology, of course, is always a little bit more complex. Um, but as court levels fall, then there is increasing trust, increasing care, increasing tendency to want to do things like share food, for example, or let someone else touch your baby. So oxytocin is also a buffer uh, against stress. Next slide. Now, when I, I particularly find wolves interesting because they, they form these very strong bonds within packs. They are also long-term pair bonders. And the pack can be extraordinarily efficient in doing things like bringing down um, large prey, whereas if they are loners, uh, they have to just scrounge for the occasional mouse or vole. But if they hunt together in packs, they can do things like 
bring down a, a, a moose cow and her calf. And since many of us, of course, have dogs, we are alert to the fact that when we watch wolves in a case like this, they are incredibly sensitive to what one another is doing. They read the body behavior of the others. They read the body behavior of the prey. They know with the most subtle of movements what the other guy is going to do. And as you know, in a case like this, uh, the wolves who are working from the rear will lame the cow. The ones from the front will instantly come in and rip out her throat. Next slide. And amongst humans, we see similar kinds of organized cooperation. And if animals trust and like each other, cooperation can emerge. So it's not necessarily the case that you need a, a gene for cooperation, as I think some people thought in the early 70s, but rather that it comes together and the children learn the social skills, they learn what's expected, they learn how to help, how to cooperate, and the benefits, the, the sort of oxytocin and reward system benefits that you get as a result of uh, cooperation. Next slide. <clears throat> um, it turns out that uh, ethologists studying wild chimpanzees and using urinary measures, which may or may not be the best, um, find that when animals share food, their oxytocin levels go up. And the thought is that sharing food might actually be much more fundamental to, to many aspects of the social behavior of highly social mammals. Next slide. Now, um, since the early discoveries about the prairie voles and the recognition that there are other uh, monogamous or at least long-term pair bonders, uh, people have tried to find whether the, the story about oxytocin receptor density is similar across other species, that is other monogamous species. And these are TT monkeys, and it turns out that there is a considerable similarity. Karen Bales at UC Davis uh, has done really important work on this. Next slide. Um, one of the things, of course, we would really like to know um, is where the oxytocin receptors are in the human brain. They're probably going to be somewhat different uh, from monkey brain and somewhat from TT monkey brain, uh, but there probably will be similarities. Now, it's there are technical difficulties here, and there really it's only possible to do the studies when a human brain comes to autopsy. And to the best of my knowledge, there are only two cases of human brains that have come to autopsy at such a time that it was possible um, to look for oxytocin receptor density in various aspects of the brain. Uh, in humans. We see it in the amygdala, in the hippocampus, nucleus accumbens, lar uh, large parts of cortex, um, the striatum, the raphae, um, and, and so forth. So there's still a, a great deal that we don't understand about humans um, and the details of the oxytocin system in humans. Next slide. A recent discovery, which I, uh, I think speaks to why wolves and, and probably humans and dogs are, are uh, very good at picking up the, even the most minor of facial movements and interpreting them in terms of intention or consequences. Uh, Pitcher and Ungerleiter published the finding that from early visual cortex, not only is there the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway, but there's another pathway involving the superior temporal sulcus that really has to do with recognizing social behaviors, social actions, social context, uh, and, and so forth. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is really just to remind us about how quickly 
we can look at a photograph, any one of these three, <coughs> and understand something about uh, the emotion or the intention um, behind what we're looking at. Next slide. <coughs> Another recent finding came from Michael Platt's lab, where they see in the orbital frontal and the dorsolateral frontal cortex that there are neurons that are very important again in uh, signaling social information, organizing uh, responses to social, uh, social contexts. So it looks like there's probably quite a lot of cortex that uh, is deployed in the context of, of uh, sociality. Next slide. <clears throat> Sorry about my throat. I've got this allergy that... Okay, so uh, we heard a wonderful talk on, on methylation and it turns out there is a methylation story involving oxytocin receptors. And the story is this, that uh, it was done with mice. If the baby mice are taken from the mother not even handled by the human, but a little cup is used to get the mouse. Uh, and the mouse is well cared for, is given food and water and warmth, but it's not given touch. It's not handled, it's not, there's none of the skin to skin connection between baby mouse and uh, mother mouse. The um, gene for the oxytocin receptor is methylated which means there is decreased gene expression for oxytocin receptors, which involves then a decreased uh, binding, and that does have an effect on social behavior. These mice are less social. They, when they grow up and have their own babies, they, they don't care for them in the normal way uh, that a mother mouse would. And this suggests that the early cuddling experiences uh, are really important in uh, maintaining appropriate levels, whatever that is, of oxytocin receptors. Next slide. So of course there are questions of, uh, pertaining to the sort of social variants we see in social groups, um, such as psychopathy, such as autistic uh, spectrum disorder. Um, and so one line of research has been to find out whether there are SNPs in the gene for the oxytocin receptor and, for example, psychopathy. And the, the data so far from uh, the Epstein lab in Australia suggests that there are polymorphisms in the oxytocin receptor gene and that they are linked to psychopathic behavior. Their study involved over 200 children between the ages of four and 16 who were identified as callous and unemotional, which is the, the uh, pre-adult designation as opposed to psychopathy. They were very carefully sorted and very carefully tested using the very well-known test for, for uh, this uh, phenomenology, namely the hair uh, checklist. And um, although these are still early data, it is a very interesting question to ask uh, and an interesting finding that will certainly be pursued. Um, a different lab looked at whether there were SNPs in the oxytocin receptor that could be linked to autism, and the answer appears to be no. There are genetic links in other areas of the genome, but not specifically to the oxytocin receptor. Next slide. So certainly it occurred to many people after the, uh, the Prairie Vole story became quite well known that perhaps oxytocin could be used as a treatment. For example, if someone was super anxious or if they were very uh, shy or if they were uninterested in uh, social 
interactions, the question was, couldn't we just do what you do with cocaine, you know, spray it up the nose? And uh, initially it looked like there were positive findings, but the, the drawback was that there is the blood brain barrier and cocaine seems to cross it quite happily. Oxytocin, not so much. Uh, it has to have active transport and that's rate limiting. And it does not appear that it, it easily crosses the blood brain barrier. So uh, what to do? Uh, people just kept spraying it up the nose, but finally there was a group um, that questioned whether or not uh, it really does get into the brain when you spray it up the, the nose. And they used a macaque model and they had five different macaque mo uh, monkeys. And what they found was quite interesting. And that is that very tiny amounts actually do get into, they tagged it, of course, they deuterated it. Uh, very tiny amounts do get into the brain. And then the question was how? The current theory is that there are tiny holes in the cribriform plate of the nose and that the little small amounts of oxytocin get through those holes and they drift along the outside of the olfactory nerves and the trigeminal nerves and maybe eventually end up, for example, in orbital frontal cortex. So where in the macaque after um, intranasal treatment, where they did find uh, tagged oxytocin was in the orbital frontal cortex and of course the olfactory bulb, but also in the striatum uh, and the thalamus. It does not seem to have much effect on those with aut autism. Um, it may have some effect on those with anxiety disorders, um, but these are early days. And I think the, the initial hope that, you know, all would be well, you could just, you know, buy your oxytocin and spray it up the nose and your little shy child would suddenly become uh, socially confident. That seems, that seems unlikely at this stage, but of course, we're always ready for surprises. Next slide. So I want to go back really to the fundamental motivating question, which was, I think, the one that Ed Wilson asked about, about mechanism uh, for morality. And I think we do understand quite a lot more about that. And that is that sociality, being having social instincts, caring, being bonded to others, being connected to others, begets other caring. When others need something, then you are prepared to incur a cost. And we know that that happens in rats. We know it happens in, in monkeys and chimpanzees. And we certainly know it happens in humans. But there is a lot of social learning that goes on in all highly social mammals, wolves and dogs and humans. But social learning becomes very natural and very straightforward as long as you have the, uh, the mechanisms in place for wanting to be a social animal in the first place. And then as, as Darwin rightly realized, there's also problem solving, which we can come together to engage in when the ecology changes or the environment changes, when, for example, things change and we begin to be not hunter-gatherers, but farmers and herders and living in very large groups, then very different kinds of problems arise than do arise in an, uh, a small hunter-gatherer group. Next slide. Morality, I think uh, what, what's right and what's wrong is always very complex. There is this tendency to think, well, you know, all we have to do is have a single rule or have the Ten Commandments and all will be well. But of course, you only have to reflect very briefly to realize how untrue that actually is. Because norms conflict with other norms. They vary across individuals. And they vary within an individual over time and as a function of experience and just plain age. And 
Some memories are relevant and some memories are not relevant and how that is determined by the brain, uh, we still really do not understand. Next slide. And, and I think one of the things that, again, to go back to the ethologists and their wonderful observations in the wild and, and in, in captivity is that some animals that you think aren't particularly social may end up being quite social. There are wonderful, of course, you know, YouTube has everything and, and there are, wonderful videos of bears who are typically, of course, apart from the mother baby, mother baby pair, um, bears tend to be loners, but given adequate food and, and resources, they will befriend a cat, they will befriend a dog, they will befriend a human. Uh, and here we see a monkey and a dog, um, enjoying each other because sociality engages the reward system and is very pleasant and they don't have much thought um, to carrying on their genes. But of course, when resources are very uh, strained, then that kind of sociality uh, is, is seen, I, I expect, as a luxury. Next slide. So this is... Uh, taken this talk as kind of draws upon um, what I discussed in, in the most recent book, which, uh, which I show here. And with that, I would really be happy to, to answer questions and, and discuss this further, but uh, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. That's really beautiful. Uh, there, are a there are already a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I will take uh, I will take my uh, discretion to make to ask, ask one or two questions myself to allow a few more to uh, accumulate in there. So that was it was just really beautiful. I was you know when you were talking about conscience in uh, non-humans, I was thinking about our puppy this morning. We got a COVID puppy and he stole my wife's breakfast, her bouza, and <laughs> uh, she rather, and she clearly knew that she had done something wrong. She had a you could see the look on her face that her sense of guilt. And so um, there are sort of two questions about that that bring to mind in, in the context of your talk. First of all, you were drawing, you seem to be drawing this parallel between pair bonding and conscience. Mm -hmm. And uh, to what extent are those two tightly linked? You know, do you think that uh, pair bonding, you think that this development of a sense of conscience is intimately linked to pair bonding, that something about pair bonding also generalizes to conscience and to societal behavior more broadly? Or are there animal species you know of that don't show pair bonding at all, but that still have a strongly developed sense of conscience and guilt? Oh yeah, no, no, I, I'm sorry about that. I think I must have misled you. I think that 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 the origin of, of sociality really is in the mother-infant bonding. I see. That's, where, right. that's the ground floor. Uh -huh. And, and that involves oxytocin and oxytocin receptors. And then if you're mother nature, and it turns out that having pear bonding is really good for the prairie voles because they live on the open prairie as opposed to the mountains, uh, and they live in com big communities, um, then you just basically say, okay, well, I'll, I'll change the, their behavior by sticking in some extra oxytocin receptors here and there, and then if you're a baboon, you still live in a, in a group, you're still intensely social. They are very caring with regard to others in the matriline. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to see as we get more and more data on the distribution of oxytocin is that the, the social organization that an animal has is going to be determined uh, by its oxytocin profile, the, where the receptors are, where the oxytocin is, and so forth. But it, it is a, there is this funny thing, and I started with the, the uh, picture of the orangutan and the dog, and the orangutan was sitting there with his arm around the dog. Now, ethologists have told us for a long time that orangutans are loners. Hmm. So here's this orangutan. This is in a rescue center in Iowa. And the orangutan has been there 
few years. And one day the dog comes in, da, 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 and the dog loads around and he, the dog and the orang bond. And now they're absolutely inseparable. One goes swimming, the other goes swimming. So you wonder, is it maybe that in the wild, given that they are essentially vegetarians and they have to have a big space, that a lot of their sociality is inhibited, but when conditions permit, okay, the, the wiring is all there and it just comes out. So then you're thinking that maybe- well, humans... Their bonding is just an instance of, of, uh, of morality. Okay. And, um, and we, about 98% of birds, of course, are long-term pair bonders, but you can understand why that is. So you're thinking then the human specific aspects of conscience might relate to, to human specific aspects of oxytocin receptor distribution oh, yeah. uh, and generalizing. I see. Yeah, very interesting. I, I think so. And we tend to be, by and large, long term bonders. Uh, sometimes it's done serially because we have a very long life. Right. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, bonding to others is clearly powerfully important in humans. Right. I mean, look at adolescents. They don't, they're not necessarily forming bonds for life, mm -hmm. but those friendships amongst adolescents are hugely powerful. And that's their, you know, that's their oxytocin system talking to them. Fascinating. Um, all right, so uh, now a question from the audience. Uh, from again, uh, Mariam Orkadashvili, uh, Patricia Churchland, uh, what role do mirror neurons play in such social skills as compassion and empathy? I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I don't really know where the mirror neuron story is now. I mean, the mirror neurons were sort of terribly oversold in my harsh judgment um, for a long time. <laughs> they were supposed to explain you know, how, how it is that that when, um, when you frown at me, I know that you're puzzled or you're angry. Uh, but, but it turned out that, that it isn't that like that. The story is just much, much more complex. So I don't know, maybe, maybe there is a mirror neuron or two that have something to do with social recognition of, of uh, what's going on in a social situation. But, but the mirror neuron story is really kind of petered out. Uh, here's an interesting question from Ben Sleekva. Uh, Patricia, you described wolves in packs, picking up visual cues very quickly from the other wolves and their prey. Simon Baron Cohen coined the term mind blindness and published his book in 1995 about autistic humans being mind blind. Are there any observed examples of mind blindness among primates, wolves, etc.? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And the answer is not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, you know, if you have a dog and he's completely insensitive to other dogs when they growl or they, you know, I mean, you know about dog behavior, if they're insensitive to the usual cues, either they're very young and you just have to wait or there's something wrong. Now, in the case of wolves, when that happens, they drive the wolf out. If the wolf misbehaves and, and goes for a, another dog's throat when they're playing, they pounce on him and they drive him out. So it may be that we wouldn't see it much in the case of, of, of wolves, but, but even so, there's probably, as there is in humans, variability. I mean, some humans are, are incredibly sensitive and others not so much, um, yeah. Great, here's, a, here's an interesting question um, from uh, Bryce Etienne Lacan. Uh, thinking about the circuitry and what reward systems are responsive to, do you think that pro-social slash altruistic behaviors must inevitably involve some long-term selfish benefit? In other words, do you think brain reward systems might be wired to produce behavior that cannot be justified by some possible reward for the individual? Oh, sure, oh, sure, I mean, uh, except in the sense that, um, you know, it, it, it behooves the mother to take care of the baby because at some level, even though she can't articulate it to herself, at some level, she wants to pass on her genes and that the wiring she has makes darn sure that she will take all kinds of risks to protect this baby. Mm -hmm. But no mother says, I mean, just 
mean, remember when you were in love as, as an adolescent, did you ever say to yourself, well, you know, it's high time I started passing on my genes. And I guess that's what this is. I mean, I never said that. I just thought this is love. Um, so, so, I mean, mother nature gives us an ultimate cause for all this, but the proximal cause is I love this person. Uh, here's another question from John Higgins. What role does teaching play in social problem solving when rapid changes to ecology make learning by trial and error or even imitation and emulation too slow or too costly? I don't know, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think it's problem solving about which we understand the least. I mean, we can understand how, how dogs learn uh, very, very quickly so that after a while, you know, they're three months old, it takes one trial and they got it. Um, and so, so it can be very fast. The reward system, I remember when I was a graduate student, uh, Chomsky was sort of the authority on the reward system. And his idea was that it can learn, it can teach you to salivate at the, song of a, uh, at the sound of a bell, but that's about it. And of course, now we know, I and mean, this is the other great story, I think, of uh, the, the, the 20s, is, is that we've learned the reward system is unbelievably powerful. And, and the interaction between cortex and the reward system is so complex. And it allows us to do one-shot learning in a way that, you know, a deep learning machine can't. Can't even begin to, but a dog can. Uh, and they learn very, very fast. These are some great questions. We, I don't yeah, they are. They're wonderful questions. Yeah, I don't. We're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few more uh, from Sasha Dahl. Uh, great talk, which is I think a comment shared by many. Uh, given the centrality of cortical organization uh, in mammals and the equivalent set up in birds, uh, how do cephalopod mollusks? generate their higher vertebrate-like levels of adaptive behavioral flexibility. Some may be even social or flexible. Yeah, good question. Um, and now I'm really out of my depth. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I wow. have to punt on that one, I'm sorry. Impossible <laughs> question, but fascinating. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's another question. Here's another probably unanswerable question. Uh, Question for Dr. Churchland, given the fact that epigenetics is involved in the development of social behavior, are there to your knowledge studies which try to infer the role of somatic transposition? I, for, I, for example, mobilization of transposable elements or the regulation of transposable elements in the development of social behaviors? I don't think I understand the question. Um, what kind of transposable, you mean genetically? Yes, I think the I think the questioner is referring to the mobilization of transpo retro transposons that live in our genome and jump around the sort of stuff that Rusty. Oh, 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 oh! I can't answer that one either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I would like to be able to, but I can't. Yeah. But you know, I mean, if on the on this general topic of epigenetics and social behavior. Um, the really the lead person was Michael Meany, who still has this great lab at McGill um, showing, uh, the, and, and in his case, it had to do with the glucocorticoids and the glucocorticoid receptors and methylation that, you know, da, da, da. And it's super, super interesting. And I think there's a lot of the story that, that is yet to come out um, that will help us understand variability and social behavior. I mean, we're all social to an extent, but, but, but there's tremendous variability amongst us in the ways we're social and how much we're social and the degree to which we are willing to be altruistic or willing to you know, be a fanatic and follow the crowd and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, here's a question that, uh, this is, uh, this I'm afraid will be our last question because we are, uh, but, um, so uh, Elsa R says, it was very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, are there any known developmental or temporal constraints to learning emotional facial cues or will the pandemic toddlers have no problem 
decoding faces once we stop all wearing masks? Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think they probably won't have much problem. Yeah, no, they're so disposed and they begin learning so fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think they're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, that's a hopeful note on which uh, to end. So, um, so I guess I'll start to uh, draw the symposium to a close. I just wanna thank you again. That was really, really wonderful. Oh, thank you so and much. Want, and I want to give my sincere thanks to the other three presenters we had today, uh, Sarah and Liron and Alex. And thanks finally to all those people who helped make the event possible, to the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group team, uh, Kathy Richmond, Alexandra Basford, Casey Elkins, and Nicole Huber, to the Allen Institute communications team, and of course, to the late uh, Allen Institute founder, uh, Paul Allen. And thank you to the audience for engaging questions throughout the day. We're really grateful to them. We're so glad you could join us for this session and we hope that you'll join us for ongoing Exploring Minds seminar series, uh, which will be hosted, um, which will be hosted um, every monthly for the, next, uh, for the next three months. As you can see, we'll have them on Monday afternoons. That's 2.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern time, um, 11.30 to 1 p.m. Pacific time or some other time, depending on where you are listening from. And the goals of these is to have two shorter talks, 30 or 40 minutes, rather than a typical hour seminar series and have some time then for discussion, potentially interaction between the two speakers. And you know, this, this symposium was originally planned as a in-person thing. We have just terrific speakers lined up for that. Uh, if you can uh, advance to the next slide. Um, on February 22nd, we have Philip Gunz, uh, who is a physical anthropologist who works at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. He studies developmental and evolutionary changes in the growth patterns and morphology of fossil hominins, extant humans and non-human primates. And then also we are really honored to have Christoph Koch, uh, who is the chief scientist of the MindScope program at the Allen Brain Institute and a formerly professor uh, at Caltech and also formerly the chief scientific officer uh, at the Allen Institute. He's also the author of a, a couple of books, Consciousness, Confessions uh, of a Romantic Reductionist, and his latest book, The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Everywhere But Can't Be Computed, which was published in 2019 by the MIT Press. So we expect to have some lively discussions on that day as well. Uh, can you advance the slide? On March 22nd, we have two more terrific speakers, a bit more biologically oriented. We have Professor Mark Harnett from MIT, who's a real pioneer in analyzing the unique electrophysiology of human neurons that have all sorts of features that uh, are not seen in animal neurons. And also Fana Krenan, who's already been mentioned by Alex um, Pollan in his talk today, who's a fellow in Steve McCarroll's lab. And she's published a, a large scale study of the comparative differences in cell types uh, in the forebrain of humans compared to other species. Uh, next slide, please. On April 26th, we have Two more great speakers. Erin uh, Hecht is an assistant professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard, and she studies how brains change in response to selective pressure on behavior and how brains acquire heritable adaptations for complex learned behaviors, looking at primates, but also looking at how uh, behavioral variation occurs in domestic dog breeds and domesticate and foxes that have been domesticated. It was a, uh, she gave a fascinating talk uh, in, in our seminar series locally. And then our other speaker on that day is Rebecca Hodge, who's an assistant investigator at the Allen Brain Institute and who's a leader in the human cell types program there, characterizing species differences uh, in, the, um, in the periodic table of cell types uh, in the human brain. Uh, and finally, the, the, we'll end up the series on May 24th uh, with Flora Vaccarino, a professor uh, at Yale University who's well known for looking at human specific patterns of somatic variation and the differences in genomes between different cells in the body and stem cell behavior uh, in human brain cells. Uh, so as I say, we have a bunch of uh, terrific speakers and we hope we'll uh, hear from you uh, at uh, many of them. So uh, I think that's, that's it, all we have for you for today. We hope you had fun and uh, look forward to seeing some of you in the future. And we, uh, thanks again to the speakers. Bye-bye everyone. Hi, everybody. That was great. Thank you for your um, 